the world of George R. R. Martin, called Earth, generically in the text, Planetos, Taros, or Martin World by us fans, is nowhere near fully explored, as far as we know. From the perspective of the people of Westeros, though, it's absolutely true. It isn't even close. And it's pretty much the same for us readers. The map ends, and we don't know what's beyond it, and there's things on the map that aren't fully explored. Who knows what's out there? What did the ancients explore long ago? What have they learned? What of that knowledge has been lost? Maybe rediscovered? After all, people such as the Giscari, the Valyrians, the Ibanez, the Summer Islanders have been sailing the world as long or longer than most anyone else, and some of them have really good ships and sailors, especially the Summer Islanders. What they know, the maesters of Westeros often do not. But there have been attempts to expand that knowledge, and often, as it is in our own world, a singular personality sometimes advances the boundaries of what's known by leaps and bounds, or rather, strides within a single lifetime. When we think of explorers, we think of the sea snake and Alyssa Farman, who had an urge to discover, or Nymeria and her Roynish followers, who were basically refugees, who were forced into seeking new lands. The refugees aside, Nymeria included, though, these are nobles, and a lot of the refugees got left behind because they didn't have enough money to flee. So that's a big difference. These are noble people with money compared to Lomas Longstrider, who was a scribe, right? That's, he didn't have necessarily his a crew, a ship, much funding, all the safety and security that comes with that. It seems like he lacked it. But yet he explored farther and wider than any of the above individuals. Again, as far as we know, <laughs> he was a scribe, not a lord. That's really cool. More interesting than the character, though, of Lomas are the places he went, or may have visited. We're not sure in some cases, which is part of the fun here. He wrote two books based on his travels, Wonders and Wonders Made by Man. Tyrion owned them both and read them over and over until they fell apart. A lot of us can relate to that, reading a book so many times that it's fallen apart. In this episode, we'll cover the latter of the two books, because covering it all is too much for one episode. The tale grew in the telling. We sort of planned it to be one, but, you know, <laughs> as many times has happened in the history of our show, that was not enough. So we broke it into two, and we have thoughts for a third one that goes beyond even Lomas's strides, which is a big point here. We're going to cover the latter of those two books, but we also expect our collective imagination to take us as far as Lomas Longstrider's Long Strides. All that and more on this episode of History of Westeros Podcast. How's it going, Sean? You look like you have something ready. You're ready to say something here. This is an exciting topic, isn't it? This episode is one of the wonders of the History of Westeros podcast. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) I like it. (laughs) Yes, welcome, everybody. We do have live streams almost every Monday at 3 p.m., unless it's TV season. Keep that in mind. You can catch these episodes on YouTube in an unedited form. Or you can go to Spotify and catch the edited video or to any podcast platform and catch the edited non-visual version. This episode does contain a lot of images, though, a lot of visuals. You can still enjoy it without those. They're useful, often beautiful, you know, uh, sparking the imagination. Sometimes they're stunning or epic, but they're not required. Feel free to just keep listening if you that's what you usually do. But this is a good time to remind folks that on Spotify, you can switch to video mode on any podcast that has a video feed, which ours do. These days, every episode we put out has a video feed. Older ones, not all of them do. But since you know early mid-23, 2023, that is, every episode we make comes out in video, though not all of them have extensive images like this one. So keep that in mind. Good time to remind you all that. We also got a lot of help, as we so often do, from our good friend Nina. You can check her out at goodqueenally.tumblr.com. The latest blog post over there is a testimonial to Stephen Atwell. I mentioned his passing last week. We're still feeling it. We will be for a long time. But she also, in addition to providing her personal thoughts on it, provides a lot of links and places you can read Stephen's works, which are more relevant than ever now. And a lot of you probably or maybe never checked out his writings and only heard the podcasts. Well, this is a good time to do that. 
check him out and let's make sure his, his memory lives on, which I'm very confident it will because he was so good at what he did. And if you have questions for us, this is a big, wide open topic. So very important for me to set the stage with that. WesterosHistory at gmail.com. Or if you're watching live, send your questions in the chat. And there's a decent chance we'll bring that up, get you a shout out or something like that. At the end of this episode, there's a lot of other episodes I'll bring up because we're touching on so many things in this one. And well, that's always fun. So, trivia question to get started. That's also going to be at the end of the episode, the answer to this. We know seven of the nine wonders made by man, according to Lomas. That's his book, Wonders Made by Man, right? And there's nine wonders in it, but we don't know two of them. So, of the seven we know, one of them has been destroyed since he wrote the book. Six of the seven are still standing, one is not. Which one has been destroyed? That is the trivia question. This was the first document I started when the World of Ice and Fire came out. And the World of Ice and Fire came out in 2014. That's right. This document has been in our Google Drive for a decade. A decade! Nina added notes back then. And she's added notes, you know, in this past week. Just to give you an idea how long we've been messing with this one. And that's partly why it grew to be more than the original plan. But let's get right into it with a quote that really describes quite well what we're in for today real quick for the quote i want to add that's part of why this is a wonder of <laughs> true that true that lomas longstrider asked duck are you muted Chaya? okay is am i not muted now for you can you hear me sean I can hear you, but it just doesn't sound as clear as loud. You're not. I'm telling you, you don't hear the same okay. audio that everyone else gets. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> A scribe long dead, said Halden. He spent his life traveling the world and writing about the lands he visited in two books he called Wonders and Wonders Made by Man. An uncle of mine gave them to me when I was just a boy, said Tyrion. I read them until they fell to pieces. The gods made seven wonders, and mortal man made nine, quoted the half-maester. Rather impious of mortal man to do the gods too better, but there you are. That's all the elements right there, the basic elements. Who he was, his influence on Tyrion and others, and though well, we don't have all the list of the wonders, though <laughs> Tyrion claims to have memorized them. I kind of wish he had listed them there, but that's the discussion and guessing is a big part of the fun. We kind of doubt there's wonders of the world we haven't been told about. Like, there's, there might be some wonders out there that have just never been mentioned. The problem is which ones have been designated. Most people in Westeros would not have heard of Lomas Longstrider. So it's not like they were like, oh, this is the one Lomas Longstrider wrote about, wrote about. No, most people haven't read that book. Most of Westeros isn't literate. Most of them don't read travelogues, explorer books. Tyrion and Halden are a little more unique. A lot of maesters would have, but outside of that, you just don't expect most people to have read it. So, yeah, that's a, that's a big deal. But but still, that said, there might even be something out there that we haven't heard of. Probably not a man-made wonder. That might be something more for the natural ones. Because you never know what deep, dark places of the world have never been discovered. But among things that have been built, we probably have a handle on everything that's at least in the conversation. But even that's not a sure thing. I suspect that there might be some others. I, I'm not, I don't have any confidence, but... Just comparing it to the modern world. Oh, what's the guy's name? Pliny. And I think there was another guy before him that was writing about the, the idea of these seven wonders. One, they were kind of Mediterranean centric. Right? Yes. The, the, There's no nothing in China. Yeah, exactly. Right. Or... They didn't know about the Great Wall of China or Stonehenge or to whatever extent they might have known. They didn't want to they remember they're trying to prop up their own world, their own culture and everything. So they weren't aware of or didn't want to give credit to some foreign ones. And True. the same might be, Loma seems to be going beyond that, right? That seems to almost be the point of what he's doing. But I still think that he might have done more than what the rest of our mostly Westerosi perspective would be aware of, right? Yeah, uh, Even I other agree. educated people, if they didn't read his books, might not have heard of some of the things he would might have named. So. Good point, good point. So even though we don't have 
his lists, we can narrow it down pretty well. But there's also some places that we'll bring up here and there and perhaps discuss in another episode with greater detail. Places that maybe are wondrous that we know for sure he didn't ever see. Like Blood Raven's Cave, the Greenseer Cave, whatever you want to call that. It's pretty wondrous. It's pretty epic and incredible. But Lomas was never in that cave. <laughs> so it's not really a candidate for his wonders. But so we'll have a, a things like that in this episode as well. Also, I want to point out something. It's neat to consider that there were seven, and in reference to Halfmaster, Halfmaster's quote there about saying it was rather impious of the mortal man to do the gods too better, and I, you wonder if that was part of why he chose seven, because you know he's Westerosi, the seven are a thing, you know, this is number seven is kind of sacred to Westerosi, and also, of course, it matches the seven ancient wonders of the real world, but that might have just been a nice convenient, well, everything fits for, for George when he was creating that. <laughs> now, who was? Lomas Longstride. We'll start with the character, and then we'll move into his travels, and then the specific wonders. That's basically our roadmap for today. We only have one other person named Lomas, so a sample size of one <laughs> for comparison. He was, uh, his name is Lomas Estermont. He's in the Stormlands. So, I don't know, that probably isn't an indication that Lomas Longstrider was a Stormlander, but, you know, whatever. That's that's what we have on Lomas Estermont. By the way, if Andrew... If you had to bet, if you had to guess, that would yeah. be your best one. Yeah, it wouldn't be a high confidence guess, but it's, yeah, if you forced to guess, you'd <laughs> gun to your head, you'd be like, Stormlands? I don't know. <laughs> um, so, by the way, uh, Lomas Estermont's son, Andrew Estermont, is the one keep in charge of uh, keeping watch over uh, Edric Storm right now in Lease. So there's also an Archmaester Fomus, not less, you know, kind of like Lomus, you know, Fomus. Nita jokes, this guy is the faux Lomus because this guy is, is the one that supposes the others were just humans, that the Starks exaggerated to make themselves seem tougher, you know, but like, well, that guy's wrong. <laughs> we've, we've seen the others in, in the prologue. Like, we got that out of the way quickly. So, yeah, we're shut up, Fomus. Uh, anyway, it's unlikely that Lomus was from or grew up in an overly rural or remote area because he was literate, right? That just kind of suggests a little something about education. Probably wasn't born into poverty. That can't be assumed either, though. You know, people rise from from very little. He could have been one of those types. He's certainly an impressive person, so you can't put that past him. This is a strong case to be made. He was born in Old Town or lived there because it's a center of knowledge. It's it's how you might expect to learn about all these wonders in the first place. Like where the place that would spark your imagination. He, you know, you could just be sitting there and be like, you know, the world must be full of wonders. And that would be enough. But if you read some books, and we know this guy could read, that might just really spark your imagination. Like Tyrion. Tyrion read this specific book and it sparked his imagination to go see some of these places. So there you go. I mean, it's 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 very human, very, very natural, very, very intuitive. And Old Town also would have been more uh, cosmopolitan. He might have heard stories beyond That's reading true. books, right? Travelers from all around. And uh, I think there's another argument for him being from Old Town. Now, there's some there's some holes in this argument. But again, you know, making some best guesses. He didn't name the high tower, which I think is a worthy wonder. And I yeah. think it's a strong parallel to the lighthouse of Alexandria. And he may have named it. He didn't specifically say it wasn't. It might be one of the two that we don't know. Yes. But if it's not one of the two that we don't know, then I think it makes sense that he might be from there because he might not think of it as a wonder because it was just part of his daily life. He wasn't that impressed by this thing that he sees every day. Like if you live in New York City, the Empire State Building might not seem as impressive. But if you're from Greensboro, North Carolina, and you go to New York City, you'll be blown out of the water. So a good point. he might have thought of it as too typical of his daily life and, and maybe even saw the utility in it and not just the grandeur and impressiveness mm. of it, which a lot of times wonders, typically wonders don't have specific utilization, right? There's yeah. monuments and statues and, you know, it's a impressive works of engineering and such but don't necessarily have a specific use mm. which the old the high tower does which again might have kept him from considering it as such so i agree and that's you know, that had been his standard as he traveled the world too 
is this better than the high tower or that might have been what gave him appreciation for it. you know it's like wow i have gone all over the world and i have not seen anything as tall or impressive as high tower, or, or that very little that's close so that yeah it might have been like returning after all his travels that made him appreciate it more but either way it's a good point and i like the idea of of it you know something you grew up in the shadow of it doesn't seem quite as impressive Another place he could have grown up is like High Garden, you know, another place that has a lot of books, you know, a lot of access to, to to materials. Because I'm wondering about this a little bit, because yeah, scribe that makes a lot of sense for Old Town, but a lot of books are only for like maesters and septons, and of course nobles. So you wonder, like, a scribe might be one of the few exceptions to somebody that has access to to the, the written word in places that might keep that under wraps, you know, because most people don't know how to handle a book, you know. <laughs> like, it's like don't let the regular folk touch a book, like. You know, they'll just tear it or get grease on it or something. They don't know how to properly respect the book. Do you respect books? Hmm. So that a lot of things that make sense for, I think, him reading books is what got him started. You know, he, he probably also already had the itch to travel and wander, the wanderlust or what have you. The quote from Longstrider, or rather from from uh, Haldon and Tyrion, said he was a long dead scribe who wrote two famous books. But how long ago? Uh, scribe seems kind of to undersell it a bit, though, right? Like this guy traveled vast distances across the world, isn't he? Isn't scribe kind of secondary? <laughs> you know, it's like this guy was a world explorer and a scribe. You know, I think that's the part that comes next. But that is really important. The scribe is what is huge. The sea snake didn't write a book, you know. It, Alyssa it, Farman didn't write a book. We those people are inspirations. They're amazing, but they didn't pass their knowledge down even as tenth as well as Lomas Longstrider did. So that's that's still important. The scribe part's still important, secondary, but still very important. It's like saying uh, Neil Armstrong worked for the government. Yeah, <laughs> 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 technically true, but yeah, it really buries the point. You're right. <laughs> a, little, a little bit more than that, though. Yeah. Yeah, like he, Lomas wasn't risking his life scribing, but the going around the world, like like Neil Armstrong, he risked his life. Yeah, you know, but not for work, not because he worked for the government. <laughs> not specifically. So, like Lomas could have had some money, you know, he had to have some, or he wouldn't have been able to travel, but. Being referred to as a scribe doesn't exactly imply significant wealth. So maybe he was like a middle class job, middle class guy. That might be the way to think of him. Certainly not the kind of guy that made the kind of money you could re retire early on. But, you know, the guy that had to make his way in the world and, and did so probably better than any scribe I've ever heard of. Now, but we also don't know the whole story. Like Halden said some things about him and... They know what they know about Lomas from his writings, and they may not know actually a whole lot about the person. You know, I mean, we know a lot about George R. R. Martin, right? But you could name a lot of authors out there where it's their writings are really well known, but the person, not so much. Lomas is kind of in that category. Pretty, most of what we know about him is is kind of an assumption. Uh, so educated guesses, really, for a lot of them. And, you know, his job of scribe, that's... What does that even mean? Like, you have to work for an organization that employs scribes. I mean, that's that's it's more of a career than a specific job, I guess. But anyway, people like Halden. Freelance scribe. You could be like, <laughs> yeah. scribe for hire. <laughs> people like Halden might sort of associate with him in a sense because he's the half maester. You know, it's he's got sort of comes from that academic background, but he's also traveled around a lot. He's not just a guy that sat in a tower and, and with books and, and scrolls and never seen the world. This guy, this is someone who really went out and saw the world and Halden's kind of like that too. And there are a lot of people who go to study at the Citadel without becoming maesters. You know, we hear that about nobles like Oberon and his daughter Sorella. Maybe that's what Lomas was. Someone that went there to study, but without the intent of becoming a maester, uh, had some other things. Marwin's another good example, an archmaster, absolutely a guy willing to go out and travel at the drop of a hat. Like, that's literally what we saw him do. He's like, I'm here, I'm here. Wait, what's now? What that? Daener Daenerys? Dragons? I'm hopping on a ship now. <laughs> I'm going to the docks now, heading out. That sounds like a Lomas type. Like, Marwin and Lomas would have maybe gotten along. They would at least could have swapped stories, right? And maybe Lomas had a benefactor, someone, you know, like a rich guy that was willing to pay him to go and do some of these places, pay his passage. Now, it probably wouldn't have been that big of an expense for a rich person, given Lomas wasn't like traveling with an entourage or buying a ship or anything like that. But he may have had to like work 
he may have had to like be on the crew, you know, like pull an oar or sew some sails or I don't know what, just do work to get by to make his enough money to make his next travel to make his next journey. And maybe a scribe from Westeros could, some fancy people might be interested in that. You know, he might have some knowledge. They might want to interview him, get some dirt on him and hear news from somebody that's clearly knowledgeable. I don't know, but there'd be a lot of, and, and maybe he did have a, a companion with him, you know, a, a, a swordsman, or maybe he did have a maester with him, someone that knew languages, you know, someone like that. Um, someone that would help him avoid pirates, <laughs> you know, something like that. But he may too, like the idea of books and scribes and such. Now it's, you know, now it's even more, it's just on your phone. You could just have, I, I can't even think of what to say, how amazing phones are. Like you could take notes in your phone. You could have, <laughs> you could have all the knowledge of the world in your phone, in your pocket. Now. But, but even if you go back 50 years, a book and pen and paper and keeping it dry, it might've taken some material and some package for him to lug around. He might've needed one or two assistants to help true. carry stuff and keep notes and keep stuff safe and find his way he might have just been doing it all on his own it's hard to say he might have written everything after he got back and not yeah. as he was doing it you know uh, maybe he had a great maybe. memory <laughs> you yeah know? yeah photographic um, memory i wonder too if he might have had uh, a person or maybe different people over time sending him out on these missions and especially I started thinking of him as maybe more of an Indiana Jones type character. Ooh, like again, yeah. like Indiana Jones is a professor. Well, yeah, but that's not the cool part, right? Like, <laughs> yes. so he might've been a scribe and had some job in some library, but he might've also been ambitious and daring and intelligent. And someone might've recognized it and sent him out like, Hey, go check out this thing. And he comes back with awesome stories. Like, well now check out this thing. He might've been sent out by some, like you said, a benefactor. Yeah. I might be stretching a little bit more, but I also wonder if it's possible if Lomas Lone Strider wasn't just one person, if it was a group of people, if it was like the Dread Pirate Roberts or Brandon the Builder, someone whose efforts kind of got rolled up into one person over a couple generations or something, you know? It's possible. Absolutely possible. Can't dismiss the idea. It's a, it's a, it's a workable theory. Obviously, with as little as we know about him, we can't really go one way or another, but it's, it's, a, fun, it's a fun possibility for sure. I like, think, think about his name being Long Strider, right? Yeah. Is that did he really call himself that, that? Who gave him that name? Well, yeah, did he I think take so, that name on, or that yeah, assigned so. to his persona, or is it just because his name was Long Strider is more likely to do it? Just like <laughs> John Crentist obviously becomes a dentist, so clearly. <laughs> but no, as is easel sight later, we do have at least one conflicting report on Lomas. In fact, which would point to something amiss there. So yeah. <laughs> could just be an error, but it could be an intentional error by George to show the difficulty of, of, of words like this, or it might just be a regular error, <laughs> like, the, you know, the editor's messed up. But either way, it works. It fits the setting, whatever kind of it is. We can we can incorporate it into the world and make sense of it, discuss it as if it was intentional. Nina had a great take here, too, comparing Lomas to someone we discussed in just a recent episode. In our Hard Home episode, we discussed Maester Willis who traded some of the skills that he had learned at the Citadel, like healing and counseling, for protection from one of the Hardhome chieftains, and he got to do a little ethnography about Hardhome and its people. And so uh, the idea that Lomas himself would also have skills and, and ability and, yeah. Totally I, I appreciate that comparison a lot. Lom Lomas is more about the the uh, the wonder, like the the edifices and the natural wonders, where Willis is more focused on people. But it's a very similar concept of an academic person who really does field work and focuses, gets you know, gets their hands dirty and goes goes out and does things rather than just writing. Not that the writing is important, but we we respect the one, those who do both. So he probably had skills well beyond just scribe is kind of the point here, like a, a summary of, of some of what we discussed. He probably was multi-talented, had a lot of skills. Maybe he wasn't a warrior. Maybe he wasn't a master linguist, but he definitely got by somehow. And it was very impressive. However, he pulled it off. He was good with a whip. <laughs> good with the whip. Yeah, in, <laughs> Indiana Lomas. Well, one of the wonders we're going to talk about is the three bells of... Uh, in Norvos, and one of them is Noom, so it could be Lomas Longstrider and the bell that goes Noom, like the Temple <laughs> of Doom. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a man who set out to open up the world to many Westerosi who would 
previously known so little. He wanted to expand knowledge, right? He wanted to write, he set out to write this book and, and let people know and in some ways save them maybe from having to make the journey themselves because <laughs> it's really hard to do that. But also to maybe you encourage them to make the journey if it's possible. It's a little of both. And of course, it's not just Westeros. On some of our, uh, he had an impact on, of course, of Tyrion, but a lot of other people as well. Now, did he set out with to name Seven Wonders or just kind of arrive at that conclusion afterward? That's kind of what I was getting at when we brought up the religion aspect. Maybe he was trying to do sevens because of the seven gods, but that's kind of a random guess. So let's talk about where he went. Let's do an overview of where he traveled and then get to the actual wonders. He went all over Westeros. We should be able to assume that much, though I'm not sure he went, like, beyond the wall. Maybe he did, but that's more of an assumption. I wouldn't be so sure about that. I doubt he went to, like, every single corner, every island. He may not have gone to, like, the, the island of House Farwind, you know, or Lonely Light, that is. And he, he certainly didn't go to the new Dragon Isles that hadn't been discovered by Alyssa Farman yet. But... Westeros is pretty well known by the time of his birth. People have been living there for thousands of years, so there wouldn't be a lot of like hidden things. He would know where the important things are. It'd be overseas where he would have to like read more books and, and gather knowledge, where he would have less idea of what's out there. So in Westeros, he's more like judging what's already there and, and seeing it maybe because it's closer. We don't think he went to Sothorios or Ulthos, which are the two southern continents that we know of, neither of which we know the full extent of. And he may have been warned off Sothorios before this, before he even started because of travelers who went there before. After all, we know of Genera Bilaris, the Valyrian explorer who flew her dragon so far south she never even found the end of the continent and said it was not good. You know, like it's just disease and jungle and yeah, just don't go there. Don't go there. So I really doubt Lomas went there. This is a guy, you know, trying to live, not, you know, <laughs> he was willing to take some risks, but Sothorios is so hostile. Uh, just the the fla fauna enough, let alone the flora. I mean, it's just bad. It's just bad. He's looking for wonders, not dangers. Yeah, right? good point. Yeah. There might be some crossover in a Venn diagram, but you get the, the, the wonder side of the Venn diagram before you go to the middle area, I think. And life's only so long. And these travels he took long would have journeys. taken a lifetime. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. like... I agree. Like, super long. Some of these must have taken, like, years. I mean, it supposedly takes two years to go to... Ashai and back, just just as a trader, not as someone who's like recording information along the way, you know, and stopping. And well, I guess traders would stop at a lot of different places along the way, but they wouldn't go inland, very like uh, many many miles to check out, you know, a temple or something like that. No, they would pretty much do all their business at the port and then move on. So yeah, this is this would be extremely lengthy uh, business we're talking about here. He did go to the Summer Isles though, which is you know maybe the farthest south he went. He spoke with their sages. I suspect he considered the talking trees as a potential wonder made by man, and we'll make the case for that when we get to the end, which is when we will make, all of us will make our guesses as to what we think numbers eight and nine are, talking trees will be a candidate. With Essos, it's more complicated. We can assume he went nearly everywhere in Westeros. Essos, no chance. <laughs> There's no way. He couldn't have done that in one lifetime. And... We don't even know the whole continent. We know for a fact there's he just didn't go farther than the five forts. He may not have even gone to the five forts, but he definitely didn't go beyond them. He definitely didn't go beyond this map you see behind me. You know, he didn't go beyond what we have there. Uh, he did go to the ruins of Croyain to talk to the survivors of the Roinar. It's unlikely he chose any wonders from that area since it's all ruined. But if not, there would have been candidates. Check out our episode Nymeria Mother Roin for that. And here's a quote from that. Lomas Longstrider, in his Wonders Made by Man, recounts meeting descendants of the Roinar in the ruins of the festival city of Croyain, who have tales of a darkness that made the Roin dwindle and disappear, her waters frozen as far south as the joining of the Selhoru. According to these tales, the return of the sun came only when a hero convinced Mother Roin's many children, lesser gods such as the Crab King and the Old Man of the River, to put aside their bickering and join together to sing a secret song that brought back the day. It's a nice way to, it's a nice way to bring Lomas 
into the title theme, you know, meaning a song of ice and fire and bringing him into the ideas of long night. He's one of many historians, and I'm classifying him as a historian in this anecdote because he's adding to the base of knowledge regarding the long night. We don't hear about anybody else interviewing the Roynar survivors to for this information. It's possible others have, but Lomas is the one we hear about doing it. He also writes about the grayscale, the stone men, the foul fogs and water, which Tyrion saw firsthand, and the Bridge of Dream, which Tyrion saw twice. <laughs> you would think that if Lomas also had that weird repassing of that, that just, you know, this is inexplicable, this really strange double passing of the Bridge of Dream that happens, he might have counted that as wondrous. So I kind of guessed that that didn't happen to him. <laughs> it only happened to Tyrion and those, that group and maybe some others, but, but not Lomas. Tyrion wonders at how amazing and beautiful Croyane must have been, how many weddings must have happened at the Palace of Love, which he thinks must be ten times larger than the Red Keep, and just beautiful. And, well, now the region's called the Sorrows, so it's really changed to the flip. It's the reverse. It was the Palace of Love, and now it's called the Palace of Sorrow as a ruin. In line with that, Tyrion's wonderment turns at the love of the place. He's, like, imagining all the love that must have been there, and then pretty quickly he starts to think of Taisha, and that turns his thoughts to sorrow as well. So, really, the whole, the emotion of the scene is, gets that full circle there. And had Loma seen the Palace of Love when it was whole, it sounds like it would have been a very strong candidate, but and this is a, and this is a conundrum for us. Our wonders... Are ruins eligible to be wonders under this schemata? Like, we have two to guess at, and one of them in particular is fairly ruined. That doesn't mean it isn't really wondrous and impressive, though. Like, what? at what point is it too ruined to be considered a wonder? You know? Uh, so that's a trick for us to kind of figure out and for, for you all to weigh in on what you think as well. One of my thoughts on that, on that line was the Colossus of Rhodes, after only about 50 years, I think, was toppled over by a, an earthquake. But it's still this massive statue laying on the ground. Like anyone who heard of it or wanted to go see it could still go, and even though it was ruined. Yeah. And over time, metal, bronze, and such from it was stripped away for different projects. At what point did it grand? Or yeah. Less big. At what point is it not the Colossus anymore, or not grand enough to be a wonder? Yeah. Uh, That's a t exactly. So this is and, a bit of a conundrum. And so the the Pyramid of Geese. We don't even know what state exactly it's in. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. It, let's say it was merely the foundation. And you could just see this outline of the base of it, but it didn't have any height. <laughs> but if you could imagine the height from the pyramids of Marine and see how big the base of Geese was, would is that enough for Lomas to consider it? Maybe. Yeah, it might have been. It's super yeah. tough. You're right. You you bring up you you've you've shown why this is tricky. Like, we know he went to Slaver's Bay. There's a note about him looking at, at a Giscari obelisk with Valyrian writing, which depicts the Freehold defeating the Giscari in the fourth of the five Giscari Wars. The fifth war is when they said, no more, Valyria is sacked the, the, the capital, and the pier Great Pyramid, which is sitting right outside, was partly destroyed. We're not sure how much, but the city near it was destroyed, so that meant the pyramid was no longer inhabited. No one went there anymore because the, the supporting city was gone. But yeah, we don't even know how much of it is destroyed. So that's we're gonna that's going to be one of our candidates for, for voting on later. So this is something we all talked about a lot offline. Like what counts as a ruin? At what point is it? So yeah, and we're not even sure. To further confuse the issue, we're not sure when in the timeline he saw some of these things, which might affect what state it was in when he saw it, right? We're not even sure of things like uh, if he necessarily needs to have seen it. Could would it be enough to have heard stories and seen paintings? And yeah. Like, okay, that's all. And how much would his opinion change as he saw each one? Would mm. his bar go higher? Are there any he named but later thought, never mind, I, this one isn't <laughs> worthy anymore? Uh, you know, he could have his emotion at the moment or the enthusiasm of people pre presenting it to him or the perspective of what he had seen so far. All these could be factors, too. I, I really like that idea because I figure he went out to do seven and he ended up with nine because he just couldn't narrow it down. Like he maybe he had like 15 and he managed to get it down to nine. He's like, no, I just can't get it any smaller than this. These are these are too amazing, too wondrous to, to leave off. Yeah. He's seen the Bone Mountains, that huge mountain range that separates the Dothraki Sea from everything on the other side of it, which is by Asabad, and, and so south of that is Yi Ti, and et cetera. Lots of things over there, the, the, the dry deep and all that. And he, of course, did go to Yi Ti, and he did go to Lang. And Lang is the, you know, an island 
west of the Shadowlands and south of E.T. He might have gone to Great Morak, which is the isle south of Karth that forms the southern half of the Jade Gates. It's a very large island, so it would be kind of odd for him to skip it entirely, uh, since he did go to Lang, which is also an island not too far to the east. And Lang is hostile to outsiders, and we don't hear anything about Great Morak that way. But Lomas just... Yeah, it's kind of just a missing piece. Like, Morak is, is the, probably the least talked about region in that general area. Um, so, we'll just have to leave it for now. He did go to Ashai, but we're not sure if he ventured into the Shadow or if he went all the way to the Five Forts, which is also going to be on our list. And it's kind of hard not to see him choosing it if he saw it. And it's also possible the Five Forts are one that he only read about, and that would be enough because <laughs> it's so darn impressive. But he might be like, really? Is it really that big? I got to see for sure. You know? <laughs> yeah, I wonder if he had any sense of journalistic integrity, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, needed to see it with his own eyes to count it, if that might have been. Because a... <laughs> imagine in these books that Tyrion read till they fell to pieces, it probably wasn't just a seven-page book, right? Like, yeah. I can imagine he listed all the other candidates and maybe his adventures along the way and details people told, da, da, da. He might have <laughs> listed 50 candidates for Wonders of the World, but only designated nine that Tyrion memorized, you know? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's skip ahead to uh, where he may have been from, rather, what time he lived in. Uh, we know he's from Westeros, like I said, but we don't know what time frame he lived in. But I think we can narrow it down pretty well. There's no evidence he visited Valyria, but he did visit a number of places near it, and he considered the Valyrian Dragon Roads as one of the wonders of the world. So it somewhat defies belief that he would avoid the Freehold itself. So we can surmise he was born after the Doom. Or he just wasn't allowed there. Or George just didn't want to write about Valyria yet, so he kind of just authorial license and just didn't include anything about... That's That's got to be a possibility. we got to consider the real-world potential that George just didn't want to do that because Valyria is so special and didn't want to just casually treat that. Maybe he wanted to take more time with that. But, I don't know about y'all, but I strongly like the idea that you put forward here that he was living in the century of blood. I think it all lines up really well, actually. To give us a pretty clear, like, 100-year window or whatever of when he lived. So let me lay out what Ashea is saying here. Yeah, I, I I feel pretty strongly about it as well. I'm pretty confident in this Century of Blood guess. But there are, you know, some possible flaws with the idea. But let me lay it out. So he saw the palace with the thousand rooms in Sarnor. That was destroyed during the Century of Blood. So we have, A, he didn't write about Valyria. He did write about this thing that was destroyed during the Century of Blood, so he couldn't have lived after it. Like, there's almost no chance, because he saw it. It isn't one of the things that he just wrote about. It explicitly says he saw it. So that means he was alive before the Century of Blood or during it, right? Very much. So that at least puts an end point on that. Going back before, he saw the Titan of Bravos. The Titan of Bravos isn't super, super old, and it was hidden. Bravos was even hidden from the world until the famous unmasking of Uthero, so, Bravos is the least ancient of the free cities. The Titan isn't like something they built right away. We don't know exactly when it was built. It's been standing for several hundred years at least. But to have, to, he has to have been between those two days. He has to be between the Titan's building and the destruction of the Palace of a Thousand Rooms. And given that he didn't write anything about Valyria, it kind of feels like that's our best guess, that he traveled during the Century of Blood, not long before the fall of the Palace of a Thousand Rooms, but... Maybe well, maybe like 10 to 20 years before that. Maybe even as much as like 30 or 40. We don't know when in the century of blood the palace with the thousand rooms was sacked. Probably later on because the wars of the... The Dothraki the, the gradually destroyed the kingdom of Sarnor. It wasn't just like overnight. And and Sarnor, Sath, or Sar, rather, um, the capital, Sarnath, you don't suppose that fell first, right? <laughs> it was pretty far down the line. So, yeah. Anyway, all that's to say, it feels like this is our best guess. Nina, of course, has some yeah. other thoughts on it, but let's see what she says here. Yeah, Nina, I, I don't know if I agree, but I think I see a good point here. And she says she thinks that probably Lomas traveled when the Valyrian Freehold was still extant, in that its existence would have facilitated his travels through Essos, 
it would have been easier, in other words. There would have been a single coinage, maybe, single state. That's true. And so it, she thinks it would have been harder for him to travel across Essos, not just when the Valyrian Empire was gone, but in the immediate implosion of it. and the, All the lawlessness. The, and, yeah, mm-hmm. that she thinks it would be harder. And I think that's a fair enough point. But I still just don't see why he wouldn't name a... Unless we're saying it's some Valyrian location is one of the two remaining wonders made by man... I just don't think he went to Valyria, and I don't know why he would be banned from Valyria. Yeah, that's a, it's hard to say why he would be banned. Like, why would they ban what? Maybe they don't because of the, the prophecy that says Westerosi gold or Castle Rock gold, but why would that associate with Lomas? Yeah, it's, it, it isn't, there isn't an obvious reason why he would be banned. It's, it's, it's possible, but it's not, mm, I don't know. Yeah, there may be just some prejudices. There may be, if he stated his reason was to, to take note of their wonders, they might not like the idea. They want to keep it secret. This is all very speculative, but but I, I it's also possible that he went there many times, right? Maybe he went there so many times that kind of like if he's from Old Town, he doesn't think of the High Tower as being a wonder because he's it's so right. Maybe he spent so much time there that those didn't even seem like wonders to him. He's trying to find things better than that. Yeah, or maybe his benefactor might have been from Valyria. Okay, and yeah, yeah. Know what's in the rest of the world and send him out to these other places. You don't you don't need to write about this. I already know about this. You know? Mm. I have I another, I have reasons, another answer for you. I do you. think it's a default theory Sean? that is a time that Century of Blood is when he was traveling. I have another answer for you, Sean. This is the mm-hmm. wonders made by man. Valyrians are better than men. They're, <laughs> they're like gods. Talk about the wonders made by gods and you'd have a whole book of Valyrian wonders. Well, those dragon roads should be wonders made by dragons then. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say they are cheated by using dragons. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder if it might be easier, not easier, but easier to travel as a nobody in a time like the Century of Blood. It sounds like it's chaotic, but we can't assume the entire hundred, like the Hundred Years' War, wasn't literally a hundred straight years of war. It was off and of, on. So. Of every village across the whole planet. Right. right? Yeah. So <laughs> maybe. I doubt as well, like Nina does, that's that he traveled immediately in the aftermath of the fall of Valyria, the doom of Valyria, but maybe 50 years after that, when things have calmed down a bit and the wars are maybe a little more isolated in certain places, or maybe they flare back up again. But I wonder if he had to travel like incognito. I don't think he did because he's a nobody. That's interesting because we think about our POV characters. They almost always travel incognito. Like almost half the POV characters have traveled incognito or with a false identity. Catelyn? Arya, well, Arya's had like 20 false identities, you know, <laughs> with more, with more come, more to come, you know. Sansa of, yes, Tyrion, yeah, multiple times. Barristan Selmy, yes. Quentin, yep. <laughs> it's like, wow, like so Depending many, on, ca- that's just POVs too. <laughs> like if you had a POV. You define right? incognito, Brynn. Yeah, sure. Uh, Maybe even Jamie, uh, you know, he shaved his head to be incognito. Yeah, he tried. Yeah. He tried to hide himself. Yeah, like you're t- like almost. It's like more than half the POVs have traveled <laughs> incognito at some point. You know, uh, it's pretty. It's actually kind of funny when you think about it. That way. it's like, yeah, because they they they're they're kind of famous, and so many of them have like a look. Like Starks have a look. Like John gets recognized as a Stark beyond the wall by people who have never seen him before. It's like whoa, yeah. So you can kind of see why they they want to conceal their identity. But Lomas, as far as we know. He's a nobody, I guess. That might that might be good. Like, well, that guy's not rich. He's not worth anything. Who cares? You know? He's not a target of kidnappers or slavers or whatever. Well, slavers he would be because everyone's their target. But, <laughs> but, but other than them, you know, <laughs> he's not he's not a valuable hostage. He's he could be a valuable, you know, employee, forced employee, I suppose. So that'd be the one thing he would have to wa- to look out for would be slavers. And sla- disguise wouldn't stop slavers, right? They're like, well, you're right. a person. You're a person. So we want you <laughs> unless he disguises himself as a tree. They won't, you know, they won't. <laughs> Yeah, so like Sean said, war wasn't raging everywhere. Instability wasn't everywhere. There's things you can do. It still takes a certain level of bravery, though, a certain level of like, I want to go out and explore or I want to do this and that. It's it's still very impressive. I'm I'm someone who likes to stay at home. <laughs> so this is this <laughs> kind of personality is really, really uh, is impressive to me, something that's very different. And I really seek to understand that psyche. So I'm very fascinated by the explorer personality. All right, we're uh, we're going to take a short break and come back with the actual wonders. We'll get into the the meat of the discussion and our guesses and and all of our descriptions and real world comparisons. But first, 
You can be a supporter of our show by joining us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash history of Westeros. That gives you access to a whole lot of bonus episodes. I used to list them, but we have so many Patreon only episodes now that it would take too long to list them. So just know that by signing up, you get a whole mess of content that you wouldn't have had before. In addition to hopefully uh, feeling good about supporting, you know, something that you consume. I tend to operate the same way. I listen to a lot of podcasts and the ones that I listen to the most, I support them with, with, uh, by telling my friends about them, by signing up financially if they have a Patreon. Not all of them do. But yeah, it's a pretty standard thing, I think. If you, the, one, the shows you consume the most, maybe those are the ones you should support. That's how I look at it. Your mileage may vary, but I think it's a, a reasonable basis. Also, shout out to our Twitch streams. Most Fridays, I stream CK3 for A Song of Ice and Fire, which is a lot of fun. It's a big, complicated role-playing game and set in the world of A Song of Ice and Fire with dynasties and wars and artifacts and murder and intrigue and all sorts of fun stuff. We gather it on, on Twitch most Fridays at 6. Aziz's next Aziz's next Twitch stream will be uh May 3rd, Friday May 3rd. Uh he'll be taking uh this week off. He's going to a little Song of Ice and Fire event, but he'll be back with the Nine Penny Kings. That's right. We'll be doing starting a new campaign, so I get in while it's early. So we talked a lot about Lomas as a person, but surely it's his travels his places that he's been to that are the greater point of interest. Let's get into the wonders of the world. Our thoughts on whether he saw Valyria aside, because if he did, we have no writing about it, so we can't really do much more with that. But it is definitely the Valyrian roads, which prompt Tyrion's thoughts of his idol in the first place. Quote, Come moonrise, they were back in their saddles, trotting eastward under a mantle of stars. The old Valyrian road glimmered ahead of them like a long silver ribbon winding through wood and dale. For a little while, Tyrion Lannister felt almost at peace. Lomas Longstrider told it true. The road's a wonder. The stone roads of Valyria were one of Longstrider's nine. The fifth, I believe. The fourth, said Tyrion, who had committed all sixteen of the wonders to memory as a boy. His uncle Jerrion liked to set him on the table during feasts and make him recite them. Jerrion had a bit of uh, explorer in him oh, as wait, well, oh, getting lost in the Jerrion had a bit of explorer in him as well, getting lost, you know, trying to search the ruins of Valyria and... Well, we never heard from him again, but we talked to him, we talk about him in our episode, The Lost Valyrian Steel. Yeah, it's too bad Tyrion, we don't have like a brand, like a vision of Bran, like seeing Tyrion reciting <laughs> 16 Wonders or something like that. That's, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> of course, then we'd lose the fun of, of guessing. So we, we went either way. What's a bit unusual about this conundrum is that even though we don't know which sites he specifically designated as Wonders, we almost surely know what he was choosing from. Yeah, at least, you know, not from Long, Lomas Longstrider. We always, we might learn about things from other people. It's something I said, I, I touched on at the intro. Like Lomas considered the caves of Norvos as one of the natural wonders of the world. But again, what would he think of the caves, that, Blood Raven's caves? Would he say, oh, this is even fancier? So yeah, a, a reminder that we would keep those things in mind. Like what else have the children of the forest seen or the giant scene? Like the lands beyond winter, lands of always winter. Like I don't think he went there, but that might be pretty wondrous. Would he say fancier or creepier? Yeah, uh, fancier is uh, definitely not the right word. I don't know why I said <laughs> fancy. There's bones everywhere. I mean, that's not fancy. Yeah, like bones on the ground. There's dying things. It's too dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah how could you tell it's fancy? You can't see a damn thing in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's, uh, let's lay out what we know. We, of the nine man-made wonders of the world, there are two unlisted, like we said. And at the end of this episode, we'll, we'll take our guesses. Of those seven, uh, oh, and, and yeah, uh, one for sure is in Westeros with other candidates being there as well. And then, uh, w which we'll talk about in a separate, a separate episode, of the seven made by gods and or nature, we only know one slash two. So it's a lot 
harder for those. That'll be a little be a lot more guesswork when we do part two of this. And so we don't know. In other words, to reverse that, we don't know two of the man-made and five or six of the natural ones. And he traveled to places that he didn't quite deem worthy of wonder status, which is why we have so much material here, because we have places he went to and maybe named a wonder, but we don't, we're not even sure. So some of these will be like wonders that made it, and some of them will be like wonders that didn't quite make the cut, and some of that's kind of up for us to decide. And kind of like our episode last week on The Missing, we're not doing deep dives on any of these. We don't have time to do a deep dive on any one of these since we're trying to do more of an overview So you out there, if you want us to do a deep dive on any one of these in particular, all of them is a viable option, (laughs) then let us know. Sometimes the item, the wonder, is represented by what's around it, not just what it is. Like Nita suggests that it's not just the wall, but the whole institution of the Night's Watch that adds a little boost to the the wondrousness of it all. The, The men of the Night's Watch are part of what makes it wondrous. Their dedication, their devotion, their their vigil, their endless vigil, but also the freaking 700 foot wall of ice itself, you know, but I, I, that's the main part. But I think the history and the length of time and the people associated with it are part of it. I think that's part of what makes it wondrous. Don't, would, would you agree with that, Sean, you think? Uh, this is a point made by Nina, and I think it's a very good point. Yeah, I think similar, the, uh, think of Karth. Right. It, it's the walls of Karth, I think, is what he names. But what if the walls weren't there? The city of itself is still pretty impressive. Maybe it doesn't get named as a wonder. Right. Yeah. But say the walls are there with the city, but none of the artistic carvings are on the walls. Does it still get it? It's the conglomeration of all those different things, I think, that does it. And again, like I was kind of saying earlier, this isn't exactly scientific. In the real world, it wasn't either. It wasn't like Mm -mm. a group of leaders and scientists and engineers from across the world came together with with a a list of standards and then searched out everything that met those. You know, it's just people saw it, thought it was impressive, threw it on the list. You know, so the 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 combined efforts uh, that make it or maintain it could be as much a factor as how far away it is or how it's being presented to you. What if when he got the cars, people ran out shooting bows and arrows at him and he had to run away? Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I don't name that place. You know? <laughs> the land of angry bowmen, yeah. And on some level, it, it seems like historically in the real world, it was, it's like a kind of a, a, a modern thing now to travel, like travel agents and travel guidebooks and destination weddings and all this different stuff that, that would have been more difficult in ancient times for most people, but it still would have been fun and exciting to read about these places you don't really have the ability to visit. And someone who maybe did have the ability to visit might not know where to go, but when someone says, these are the seven wonders, well, that's where I'm going. Especially if Lomos did have some benefactor who was trying to promote who, who wanted their the, own yeah. country or mm-hmm. their own shipping services or whatever else, you know. <laughs> there, there may have been a thing behind it, yeah. It's hard for us to account for that might have caused them to choose one over another but i i don't necessarily completely expect that but i i am to your point i don't think it's just the image of the physical structure i think there's all these other things involved yeah and i think that's important yeah like when we choose wonders in the real world you're right there's no single governing body like the guinness picks picks wonders but there's unesco picks world heritage sites and like usa today did a yeah. thing where they picked new wonders and they had judges who were like experts it wasn't just like TV personalities only, but still, like, yeah, these things just come out of nowhere. There's no central authority for any of this stuff. The, the there are seven modern wonders of the world, but it was just an organization that decided to take a poll. Yeah, and they had billions of dollars and gave out prizes, and it was a whole thing. It lasted years, although it was just people calling in, and like <laughs> South Korea incentivized its population to call in <laughs> to to you know they I think they gave out the equivalent of like millions and millions of dollars oh, to people wow. to call in and sure enough they got jeju island as one of the seven natural wonders of the, of the world well maybe <laughs> so, the again, eight sean it isn't a fantastic spot but it's not totally scientific even in modern times right 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 so. 
Well, maybe Sean the Eighth natural wonder of the world is the motivational speakers and uh, spirit of <laughs> South Korea. <laughs> yeah, right. We'll have to we'll have to put that one in the in the thinker and, and ponder it for a while. So we don't know what order Lomas put them in. Not even sure that matters, but it's possible one day that that he put them in some specific order for that. We only know that the roads are number five. So we'll do that ourselves. We'll start with the most familiar, the one that features by far in the most chapters. It's the wall, 300 miles long, seven feet high. It stretches from one side of the continent to the other. Yeah, you know it. You know it. 700 feet high. You might have misspoke there. Just oh, yeah. Okay. It. Either way, yeah, 700 <laughs> feet high. We discussed the wall recently in our A Song of Ice and Fire in Rome episode because the wall was inspired by Hadrian's Wall and not the initial edifice itself, though that was part of it, so much as the feeling that a legionary standing atop that wall would have. That's the thing George was trying to capture. The edifice was secondary to the feeling a person would have, a legionary, wondering what might emerge from the frozen wilderness to the north. And Tyrion reflects that awe here. When he had donned his glove again, Jon Snow turned abruptly and walked to the low, icy northern parapet. Beyond him, the wall fell away. Beyond him, the wall fell away sharply. Beyond him, there was only the darkness and the wild. Tyrion followed him, and side by side, they stood upon the edge of the world. As he stood there and looked at all that darkness with no fires burning anywhere, with the wind blowing and the cold like a spear in his guts, Tyrion Lannister felt as though he could almost believe the talk of the others, the enemy in the night. His jokes of grumkins and snarks no longer seemed quite so droll. Yeah, he was expecting to, you know, pee off the wall. He didn't. <laughs> he didn't even think of it because he was bewondered. You know, he was like, wow, this is amazing. And he, but it was tinged with, with fear, you know, as well. It wasn't just wonder. It was those two, those two emotions together. We've discussed the wall plenty of times, of course, perhaps most prominently in our episode on Brandon the Builder and our patrons only episode, The Buildings of Brandon, where we discuss how it was built and the potential of using giants as slaves and or friendly workers, maybe one or the other. So, yeah, Hadrian's Wall is a real life comparison. So is the Great Wall of China. This is probably the most obvious of the man-made wonders just on the sheer size of it, right? It's it's also the oldest that we know of. It's possible the high tower is a wonder and the high tower's foundation is probably older than the walls, but the completed version now isn't. Yet again, there should be a book Wonders made by giants. <laughs> Wonders made by giants. That's right. That's a... <laughs> you know, you're you're joking there, but I, I actually meant to make this point earlier. There literally could be more books. There could be more wonders <laughs> that Lomas Lonstrider named, like Wonders of Essos or Wonders of Westeros that either Terry never got or they were destroyed. Like they just got wet in a storm at sea or, you know, yeah, it's it true. very possible that there's more. Yeah. Culinary I mean, we, we certainly wonders. know of a lot of real books in the real world that we know the titles of, but there's no copies of them. I said culinary wonders. Culinary wonders. <laughs> George, George has already written that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the wall, it's not, it's not hard to figure out how he got there, right? There would be no King's road. So he may not have just walked up through the neck. He may have just taken ship to White Harbor. That's probably the simplest thing. And we'll see a pattern there with the, the Westerosi options, which we'll come back to because the rest of our se known seven are not in Westeros, but several of the ones that we're considering for the missing ones are. So as well, Nina points out when he visited the wall, even though we're not sure when it was, it would have been a lot larger than it was today because it was the conquest that saw the decline of the wall. And he definitely was there before the conquest. So when he went to the wall, it might have been even more impressive because there would have been a lot of people. If he went now, it would maybe look a little run down. It might not be so. The, the edifice is still impressive. The, the looking out over the wall. Would still be, but the people, it, it might not seem so impressive anymore. Like you got hardly anybody there. You know, there's a lot of criminals. <laughs> the number of like knights and lords, that population has declined severely. So, yeah. Part of the impressiveness might have been, as we were saying, beyond just the physical appearance of the wall, but the process of feeding all the people manning it. And yeah, you know, uh, that's uh, true. All the upkeep and bustling and, and uh, 
supply and everything to maintain that might have added to the impressiveness. Yeah, the fact that the, the North supports it, that might be, yeah, that's that's a wonder. It's kind of unique in that sense, uh, semi-unique anyway. So I don't know, y'all, even with Nina bringing up the thing about the Night's Watch, adding to it, I think if you came upon that wall completely unmanned, no one is there, nothing's going on at all, I think it's a wonder. It's still a wonder. I think it's still yeah. a wonder. I, I guess you're right. Wonder. You don't need the people there to make it wondrous. It just, I think it adds to it, but you're right. You could, it could be completely abandoned. You'd be like, whoa. Like like the five forts seem to be. <laughs> they seem to be completely abandoned and are probably on the list too, but not explicitly so. So the Valyrian Roads, let's come back to that. We've already quoted the roads when we introduced this topic through Tyrion. So here's a different take. Though Yi Ti is a vast land, much of it covered by dense forest and sweltering jungles, travel from one end of the empire to the other is swift and safe, for the great web of stone roads built by the eunuch emperors of old have no equal in all the world, save for the dragon roads of the Valyrians. So he's talks about how impressive these are and then says, but these are even more impressive. It's the second wonder we see. We see the wall first, like, what, chapter six or seven when John goes there. But we see, actually, maybe we see these first. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, because Danny goes out on a branch of the Valyrian Roads in her third chapter right after marrying Khal Drogo. And it's only barely mentioned. It's just, you know, kind of just part of the scenery. And it's... They go really far. Like, these are also called the Dragon Roads. And the real-life comparison is just, well, asphalt. Or the Roman Roads, to, go, to use something ancient that lasted a long time. The Roman Roads maybe are more like the Yeetish Roads, because they're more like a regular stone road that required a lot of upkeep. But that upkeep was done, and they lasted forever, and some of them are still there. The Valyrian Roads apparently are different than asphalt in that they don't require upkeep other than keeping them clear which no road can self clear itself you know self clear like a tree falls over it you still got to move that out of the way if some rubble falls you still got to do that but the road itself doesn't crack doesn't wear down from rain or heat or anything like that asphalt does but it's remarkably strong at, at handling the elements so this is just a kind of a magical version of asphalt i think or dare we say more sophisticated version if it's not not magical, but I think it probably is. Yeah, I think that this is another example of something that uh, that we take for granted in the modern world is roads. That mm -hmm. I mean, not only that we have them all over the place and <laughs> the amount of traffic that they manage and all the different weather they have to be built in, but sometimes they're just these massive bridge on bridge of circular. Like it's just incredible what humans have done when it comes to roads. And uh, we kind of take it for granted. We don't realize how impressive if Tyrion saw it or if someone from, once again, you don't have to go back to like 2,000 years. If you just go back 100 years and let someone see the roads that we built now, it's just mind boggling. Yeah. How amazing they are. There's probably like parts of your, any, like any one of you out there listening right now, there's probably parts of your community that you lived in or have lived in that was not accessible a few hundred years ago. Like the, the community exists because of a bridge that connects them. Like otherwise this, this city wouldn't be viable because it's just too remote. But this bridge makes it not remote, right? And that's, yeah, you're right. So roads kind of do the same thing. They, they create connection where there maybe wasn't some. And these roads are special because they have lasted thousands of years, which is like even the Roman roads, well, maybe 2,000 years is the most you could say for those. These are way longer lasting and have required far less upkeep. So that's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. And like you said, it's it's not necessarily impressive right away, especially the modern world. And it might not have been that impressive right away to Lomas Longstrider. But as he saw how straight they were, how durable they were, how extensive they were, how far they went, how many square miles they covered, and, and then learned how durable they were, which he might not have known that right away. And then see, wow, none of these are broken. No, these are all – that. it's the building of that that – gradually makes it more wondrous when he's like, well, this is incredible. When he realizes a combination of what it took to build the roads and what they are enabling, 
Mm-hmm. Like the longer he travels on them and the more connections he sees they create, like think of what it would have taken for him to get to the wall, right? Like we were just talking about, he wouldn't have had the King's Road to travel on. So think about what an ordeal it would have been for him to get to the wall. Now over here, he's traveling that same distance in a week instead of three months or something, mm. right? And sees all the other people also traveling this distance with such ease. That's a good point. That would shift his gears in realizing how valuable it was and how much to change the landscape. Never mind the effort that went into creating it. Like That's a great point because if he had traveled Westeros when the King's Road existed, which he didn't, this would still be really impressive by comparison. Right. But he traveled it when there was just like a lot of dirt paths and there would have been some roads, but like they'd be nothing like this. So this would be this would be an order of magic. Like, whoa, I didn't he wouldn't have even necessarily have known such a thing was possible. Maybe he read about it in advance. But yeah, this is one of those ones that it might have looked pretty impressive right away, but it probably wasn't a wonder, like right off the bat, you know, but like over time, he's probably like, damn, this is like wondrous. You said, <laughs> like you said, another thing that would happen over time is you would witness the rain not shut everything down. Once again, like traveling to to the wall or just from any, almost any two places in Westeros of, you know, more than a few days travel. The first time it rains, suddenly you just shut. The, okay, we can't go now. We have to wait yeah. until it stops raining. But the the and the longer you have to travel the more likely you are to hit rain so these roads you could travel so far so quick and when it rains you still don't get shut down and so many people get to do it it's and and he would speak to people that know the difference because those roads don't cover everywhere so right, in westeros yeah. you don't have any roads like that in in essos you have crappy dirt tracks and the valyrian road so you really are like Oof, damn it i'm gonna have to take the crappy tracks but like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So he would hear that from people like, oh, these things are incredible. Like the first time he sees like multiple wagons just like cruising down, he'd be like, huh. Having been used to seeing wagons stuck in the mud and all these other things, you're like, okay, then. Yeah. So it's really just a the body of knowledge builds and it becomes more impressive over time. Okay. Let's move on to the triple walls of Karth, starting it right off with a quote. Three thick walls encircled Karth, elaborately carved. The outer was red sandstone. The outer was red sandstone, thirty feet high, and decorated with animals, snakes slithering, kites flying, fish swimming, intermingled with wolves of the red waste and striped zorses and monstrous elephants. The middle wall, forty feet high, was gray granite, alive with scenes of war, the clash of sword and shield and spear, arrows in flight, heroes at battle, and babes being butchered, pyres of the dead. The innermost wall was fifty feet of black marble, with carvings that made Danny blush until she told herself that she was being a fool. She was no maid. If she could look on the gray wall's scenes of slaughter, why should she avert her eyes? from the sight of men and women giving pleasure to one another. The outer gates were banded with copper, the middle with iron, the innermost were studded with golden eyes. All opened at Danny's approach. Wait, what? All eyes opened at her? That last part is like, wait, what? (laughs) What is going on there? Is that some sort of strange artifice, like a trick of the light, or is it some sort of actual sorcery going on there? It's Either way, it's amazing. It sounds incredibly spectacular. I think it meant all the gates opened, not all the eyes, all the studded gold eyes opened. Maybe. But yours is cooler. So (laughs) (laughs) That's possible. Yeah, all opened, all the gates open. You might be right. The gate I might might be referring to the gate. Either way, (laughs) a a thirty foot red wall, a forty foot gray wall, and a fifty foot black marble wall. Now the only other place we know of a black marble wall is in the 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 black walls of Volantis, which keep the blood of Valyria from mingling with the lesser folk, right? Well, at least according to them, obviously. I I don't co-sign that (laughs) statement. (laughs) But uh, this wall, Karth is huge. And each of these three walls encircles the entire wall, and there's carvings the entire way around. That's absurdly amazing. Like, the level of artwork here is incredible. And like you said, Sean, though, I really do think that if you don't have a city there, if it's just these walls, which would be weird, but if you did, it might still be wondrous, but it might, let's say that adds more to it than, say, the the people of the Night's Watch add to the wall, you know? Yeah. Now, it's 
also well, being such a huge city and being a port city this wouldn't be very hard for him to get to you know like take a ship there it's a long journey but it's not like how the heck am i gonna get to karth it's just mostly just a matter of having money having the the, the fare to pay your way there especially if you're like leaving from king's landing or gull town or old town where there's gonna be plenty of ships so uh, the city of karth is, is also really amazing i wonder what lomas thinks of it no other particular wonder there. This is almost certainly the most wondrous thing about it, according to him. But Danny was really blown away by it. Um, I kind of doubt he saw anything like it, though Yee-T might be something that trumps it. And if he saw Valyria, then that might be another one that does. But what I mean by it, well, the reason it's so impressive is that it's been a mostly uninterrupted, massively wealthy place that's been so for eons with a, an entrenched hierarchy that's been there just as long so they've just been growing fat and rich for so long and just outdoing each other with it's an ultra wealthy place that has been ultra wealthy for so long like imagine the gilding on top of gilding on top of gem encrusted gem encrusted gilding <laughs> you just like this is what rich people do with their extra money they just put another layer of gilding on it right <laughs> it's like what am i gonna do well i have all this money let's let's make our place fancy well how do we do that well let's outdo other rich guy that lives down the street and they just keep outdoing each other with displays of wealth and this has been going on for thousands of years so yeah it's pretty insane like danny thinks zaro's palace makes illyrio's manse look like a quote swine herds hovel <laughs> Illyrio's mats the guy with rings on every finger gem, like more precious than the last <laughs> the guy that yeah I mean this guy is ridiculously wealthy but Zaro apparently is orders of magnitude more wealthy and this palace is the size of a market town a palace the size of a town yeah that's but it's the walls that he marked as the wonder so that really says something like this was not more impressive to him than the walls which is like wow yeah it's really really must be substantially expensive walls here <laughs> So the walls of Constantinople are maybe our best real-world parallel. Constantinople actually has a lot in common with Karth. Um, Istanbul, not Constantinople. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Istanbul, that's right. <laughs> Constantinople was famous for its walls, and there have been so many walls around. I looked this up. This is kind of funny. Check this out. There was a wall when it was founded. We don't know what that was called. But then there were the Constantinian walls, the Theodosian walls, the Black Hernai walls, the sea walls. The, Gordon Hone, the, the Golden Horn Wall, the Propontis Wall, the Anastasian Wall, and the Walls of Galata. These are all walls at Constantinople before Istanbul. <laughs> 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 so it's a valuable location, extremely rich from trade. It's settled in ancient times. It's not a world wonder. Constantinople isn't. But it's, yeah, it's it's a very similar situa situation where it's a, sits, sits in a really rich natural port location. It controls trade. The carvings all the way around the wall remind me of one of the modern world wonders that I've seen. It's not that modern. It was built in what, like the year 1000 or something. It was Angor Wat. So it wasn't ancient, but it's not modern either. It's kind of in that tweener location. Angor Wat is a huge palace complex in Cambodia. It's Like I said, it's beautiful. It's astonishing. Uh, there's just carvings uh, all around it. Just bass reliefs just everywhere. It's just impressive. So many of them. It's like the size of a city block, right? Am I? Yeah, it's, it's like enormous. A, a massive structure that's ornately designed all around the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, and Cambodia is is a is benefiting greatly from new satellite technology, kind of like the jungles of the Amazon, which they're using. They can now use lasers to discover ancient ruins by like looking for density in the jungle, because they can find stone that way. And there's like 2,000 temples in Cambodia. Only about 500 of them have been excavated. But it's only in the last like 20, 30 years that a lot of these have been revealed. So they're just, just now getting to it. That's also where uh, the original Tomb Raider with Angelina Jolie was shot. Because they, they, those temples just look so cool. They look, like a, they look like something that would be fitting for that. So anyway, it's kind of the things I think of when I think of this. You know, this is making me think of another uh, factor of what might be chosen as a wall. A wall uh, as a as a wonder is it is rolled up in a couple of things, but how remote the location is, right? Like you have to travel far through wilderness to finally come upon the wall. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And Karth is kind of the same way. I guess it's a little easy to get there by ship, but it's surrounded by a massive desert. True. And so not only does it maybe add some 
contrast when you have to go on this great journey to get to the place, but also think what it took to build the place, given how isolated it like Angkor yeah. was in the middle of the jungle. How did they yeah. get all the people and supplies there and feed them while they were working on it and everything? It's just a massive undertaking. It, I, I'm just so impressed with how some of these real world things were built, especially before computers and steel. You know, <laughs> yeah, right. Do this is like people like thinking about it and breaking her back in the sun <laughs> all day, you know? So already you all can see how George was very inspired by a lot of real world wonders. There's already several strong parallels and that's going to continue. It's also not just the exact edifices, the exact wonders, but kind of the purpose of them. Like there's, there's set, there tend to be categories here. Like a lot of these are built for defense or religious purposes or authority purposes or uh, for just, getting around like the roads and the bridges expansion of connection like connectivity so authority religion connectivity and defense and those things often overlap like authority and religion go hand in hand let's be honest like those two things are very connected like people use religion to control and use yeah that well we all know that i don't have to explain that one uh, one of the people who mentions Karth is Penny of all people. She brings it up and says, "We could, you know, she she kind of tries to pull a Jora with Tyrion, where where Jora tries to get Danny just let's just go east and leave all this behind." Penny is kind of the same. She's like, "Let's go to Karth. They have fancy, cool walls there. You've heard of that, right?" And Tyrion's like, uh, "I'll just read about it in Lomas's book. I don't need to go that way. I got, I got to go. Didn't mean to come this far east. This yeah, is, uh, <laughs> I'm not going farther. <laughs> to be fair, Lomas Longstrider didn't have." casterly rock to claim <laughs> you know <laughs> so <laughs> he's uh, he's got a claim to some big which which arguably is a wonder of its own it's like well like, w- screw seeing the wonders i might own one <laughs> so let's let's move on to that yeah anyway Lomas, to, to be fair on the other side of that coin lomas didn't have cersei to escape right as far as we know <laughs> as far as we know yeah hunting his head so yeah he didn't uh he didn't Maybe he, yeah, maybe he had a wife he really didn't like, yeah. Or maybe Lomas is a maybe Lomas is a woman. No, I don't think so. I think it says he, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> no, you know he should have been Lomas. He should have been Romus because <laughs> he's roaming everywhere. <laughs> Romus, wrong strider. Yeah, no, no, he roam. He he stri- strided right. Hmm. He strode right. He yeah. strode right. It's not that was a shoe company. He was Wasn't a secret. Right? Stri- he was a secret strong. He's he's Lomas strong strider. <laughs> strong strider. <laughs> strong rider. <laughs> he is a strong rider. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nina writes that Karth might be another example of just like we said, it might be the the, the wondrous of Car- wondrousness of Karth itself might add to why the walls were chosen. But it's quite possible they'd be chosen anyway. Let's talk about the next one. Oh, one more thing, Sean. Real huh? quick, I could follow up that the way Karth presents itself to Lomas might also add to him choosing it as a wonder. It mm, seems like yeah. it does it on its own anyway. But yeah. the people there are like, oh, you're naming wonders of the world? Well, let me show you all the reasons you should choose us. Here's yeah. some food. Stay in our mansion. You know, like If he was welcomed and greeted and treated to the the wonders of the city he's more likely to choose it as a wonderful city so. that's true they want to yeah they want to get famous you know they're like yeah let's let's wine and dine this guy it's not like we can't afford it we're rich as hell they, yeah. <laughs> yeah they have a certain amount of pride they want to show off their wealth clearly so yeah. we saw like when danny was there they were very proud of it like they were all carth the ancient, most ancient city they were so proud of their city that's that's true so that that that's Probably the attitude Lomas met as well, even though it was probably hundreds of years before. Uh, Karth is known is 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 somewhat famous for being somewhat static. How it's been this way for so long, <laughs> so that it would make sense that it would still have that attitude. But let's move on to the Titan of Bravos. Let's have its quote. With his proud head and fiery eyes looming close to four hundred feet above the sea. The Titan is a fortress of a type never seen before or since, cast in the form of a huge giant straddling two sea mounts. The Titan's legs and lower t- the Titan's legs and lower torso are black granite, originally a natural stone archway, carved and shaped by three generations of sculptors and stonemasons and wrapped in a pleated bronze skirt. Above the waist the Colossus is bronze, with green-dyed hemp for hair. When seen from the sea for the first time, the Titan is a sight terrifying to behold. His eyes are huge beacon fires, lighting the way for returning the ships back 
inside the lagoon. Within his bronze body are halls and chambers, murder holes and arrow slits, such that any vessel that dared to force the passage would surely be destroyed. Enemy ships can easily be steered onto the rocks by the watchmen inside the Titan, and stones and pots of burning pitch can be dropped onto the decks of any that attempt to pass between the Titan's legs without leave. This has seldom been necessary, however, not since the century of blood has any enemy been so rash as to attempt to provoke the Titan's wrath. Love that detail. There's something very cool about the Titan in that it it, it encapsulates several of the wonder types at once. It's both for defense, but it's also a lighthouse. And it's also just a really cool statue. <laughs> so there's a little bit of the authority element there, too. Not so much the religious aspect, but it also guards the past. So it is sort of a travel thing. It doesn't extend travel, but it protects the existing travel. It's You can get in if you're allowed. You can't if you're not. And if you seek the protection of Bravos via ship and you're a friendly ship, you can use it as a refuge. So that's kind of neat. And the, the natural stone archway added to over time is really cool. Three generations of sculptors and stonemasons. That's awesome. I love the, the torches in each eye seen from far off. We talked about how Karth just emerging out of the desert would look really impressive or the wall. But this one is, as it says, uh, on a different level because it's it looks like a being. It looks, it's, it's anthropomorphi anthropomorphized. <laughs> that's a hard word. <laughs> And if you had never seen it before, you'd be like, oh, hey. So this is one that Lomas, when he saw immediately, might have already been like, this is a very strong candidate for the wonders list. Just from the just in the distance. And then he gets closer to it. He realizes just how big it is. He probably read about it in advance. Bravos, not at all remote, at least probably not in his era. Certainly isn't now. It's the most powerful of the free cities these days. And ships go back and forth from it constantly that are going to Westeros and elsewhere. So Bravos is just known worldwide. It's it's There was a time when it wasn't, but we're pretty sure Lomas didn't live in that era. And the green hair with the, <laughs> with the ropes, that's just really neat too. That's just a fun detail. I don't know where George got that idea from. I don't know of any... Any co where, like where that idea comes from, like the bronze, like the Statue of Liberty turned kind of green, like bronze turns green over time, I guess. And maybe that's where the green idea came from. I don't know. Copper turns green. Maybe bronze does too. Oh, yeah, you're right. Copper. Does. I mean, bronze is copper is made from bronze and tin. So it would sort yeah. of stand to reason. But I don't know that for sure. Um, might I be wonder the... how long that would last, how mildewy it would get. To yeah. Would, you know, like the moisture and the exposure to the elements if it if they have to if they have to maintain if they have to repair re repl replenish the hemp hair every now and then. <laughs> yeah the hair you would think for sure would have to be but maybe maybe say other stuff no, oh, that, yeah, that's, that's, really just how, that's just how good hemp is it could last for eons <laughs> it could last for thousands of years Super still <laughs> <laughs> it can last at least 420 years yeah happy belated 420 y'all <laughs> <laughs> it's green already yeah yeah it's got yeah. the color so the real life comparison is pretty straightforward. It's the Colossus of Rhodes. Sean already touched on it briefly. It was built, it finished in 280 BC. They started it in 292. So it took 12 years. The, the Titan of Bravos took a lot longer, uh, but it was not built consecutively, apparently. The Colossus was built after the city defeated Demetrius the Besieger, someone whose name has come up several times in the history of History of Westeros because he's got such a cool name and he was a big name in this era, the post-Alexander the Great era. He left, he abandoned his siege, partly because his father called him off to do something else more related, attack some other place, I forget which, but Demetrius had to leave in a hurry. He left behind a lot of siege equipment which was repurposed into the Colossus. They took it all and melted it down and made the Colossus. It was so it was like a victory statue. It was of their patron god Helios and was 108 feet high. So that's 33 meters. So the Colossus, I mean, so the Titan of Bravos, quite a bit taller. <laughs> quite a bit taller. So Demetrius really wasn't sieging. <laughs> the end there, I guess. <laughs> no, he he be leaving, not be sieging. No. He was he was besieging before that, but. <laughs> So, so yeah, go ahead, Sean. The, the Titan of Bravos is about 400 feet tall, yeah, right? Or yeah. That's, the, that's a, the, our approximation. 
which incidentally, that's about the size of the tallest statue in the real world, which was only built 15-ish years ago. And it's so preposterously large, I would not have believed it. If like someone filmed it in a movie or showed me a picture, I would have thought it was Photoshop or CGI. I just, it's crazy. It's like literally four times bigger than the Empire State, or not the Empire State, but the Statue of Liberty. It's probably two or three times bigger than the Empire State Building. <laughs> and it's just this guy, it's he was, I guess, a... One of the founders of modern India, you know. Yeah, he was a the statue of unity. Yeah, he was connected to Gandhi. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I'm just all. You should Google it. I just can't believe it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so freaking big. You're right, Sean. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like what? And you're. And I think it was only finished in 2018. I think it started it in 2013, and it's it's pretty new, <laughs> relatively yeah, speaking. There's, a, there's another statue that's similarly large. It's one thing is that they measure statues. They didn't. They include like the base or the pedestal or whatever. But the spring statue, the physical human form is almost the same size. You know. It's, yeah. It's maybe eighty percent the size, but it doesn't have nearly the size of the pedestal. But it's also preposterously large. But yeah. but one thing I want to point out is this Titan in Bravos was built. With no computers and no steel and all the things that <laughs> yeah. it take in the modern world to build these massive statues, they supposedly yeah. did it without that. So there's like concrete. It's okay if it took a yeah. little extra long. <laughs> yeah. Now we've said concrete is an old substance, but modern concrete is a lot better than old concrete. Yeah. So and yeah. it's reinforced with steel and all. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. And they definitely didn't have steel back then. So as you said, Sean, the Titan or the Colossus of Rhodes. By the way, Titan is a Greek word. So it's kind of appropriate for George to use that term, given that it relates to a Greek <laughs> wonder. Uh, it was of their patron god, Helios, the sun god, and it like it stood for only 54 years because an earthquake snapped it at the knees, and they were too superstitious to rebuild it. They're like, well, the earthquake is from the gods, so let's not put that back. I think an back. oracle told them or yeah, something. Yeah, they right? asked the oracle. The oracle's like, nah, don't do that. And even though Rhodes had earthquakes like twice a century like kind of like clockwork <laughs> but it's nope it's the gods he just that's what he, that's when he wakes up it's just it's, it's, it's snoring maybe the, the oracle is just a wise person like, you just have to build it again you took up so many resources cut it out stop it <laughs> yeah well the oracle was definitely wise when alexander the great threatened to kill them if they didn't give the oracle he wanted so you know <laughs> that's the form of wisdom that, <laughs> old wisdom like i die if i don't do this eh? okay i'll do that yeah <laughs> And yeah, so Sean's also pointed out that it was still there for 800 years. There were still people going to see the collapsed Colossus for 800 years after it was just lying on the ground. And there's a quote about it. Here we go. This is neat. This statue, 56 years after it was erected, was thrown down by an earthquake. But even as it lies, it excites our wonder and admiration. Few men can clasp the thumb in their arms, and its fingers are larger than most statues. Where the limbs are broken asunder, vast caverns are seen yawning in the interior. That was written by Pliny the Elder. The, 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 he just keeps coming up in our episodes. That's the same guy who, who volcanic eruptions, a certain type of them are named after, the guy who died in Vesuvius. Uh, so this couldn't happen with the Titan of Bravos because if it was snapped at the knees, it would fall into the sea. It wouldn't be sitting there for anyone to see it afterwards. But it looks like there just aren't earthquakes there. It's been there for like 400 years or so. We don't know how long, but centuries. So it's probably either strong enough to hold up to an earthquake or it's just not on a fault line or yeah. Also, by the way, I don't know how deep the sea is around Bravos, but you might still be able to see it. It's so big. That's true. Like, Maybe it would stick it out. Might still have his arms. Coming yeah, out, <laughs> that would be kind of neat. Like, yeah, just one arm sticking out. Like the Statue of Liberty and Planet of the Apes, right? <laughs> yeah. So we uh, should we also backing up just a little bit, Sean. You mentioned the Spring Temple Buddha. That's like the second highest statue in the world right now. It's that was built finished in two thousand eight. And it's uh, got a thousand tons of copper in it, and it's four hundred and twenty feet tall. So yeah, That's we were right. recording this on four twenty one, so almost, <laughs> almost uh, <laughs> the day after there. Um, it, Nina says if Lomas was writing and traveling during the Valyrian Empire, it would have been pretty bold to highlight the Titan of Bravos because the Titan, the you know, the Bravosi were like breakaway slaves from Valyria. That's how the whole nation was founded. The city state was founded by escaped slaves. And so it's kind of flaunting the existence of this place. So you kind of have to assume that it probably didn't happen. He probably wrote about it after the unmasking of Uthero, which we already kind of 
our favorite guess is Century of Blood anyway, which fits this. But in case we're wrong about that, we still want to guess that. Well, it, it probably still wasn't like 300 years before the Century of Blood. It would have been maybe two or 100 years before. You know, that is another uh, purpose, I guess, of a, a wonder like these. In addition to like travel and connection and uh, authority and defense, it's also sort of, sort of a... Uh, an exemplification of the, the the potential of your culture and your people. Like, That's look true. what we can do. You yeah. know, we built this titan. You you had us enslaved, and we achieved this greatness. Don't underestimate us. That's know? a good point. Yeah, like that is that is often what a wonder communicates to the world is shows you what this civilization is capable of, and, and there's something they can be very proud of having done it. Yeah, that's a great point. Great point. And Nita has maybe Lomas was getting back at them. If the Valyrians did like refuse to let him in for whatever reason, then, then he was getting back at them. Or he was he's like, oh yeah, well, I'm going to talk about the Titan of Bravos then. Yeah. <laughs> so that that's the third of three that are defensive so far, right? The wall, the triple walls, and the Titan. Those are all defensive. Although as we saw with the Titan, that's not the only purpose of it. The next one is decidedly not the palace with a thousand rooms. Here's a brief quote. The greatest of these cities was Sarnath of the Tall Towers, where the High King dwelt in his fabled palace with a thousand rooms. Now, given we don't know what the Eighth and Ninth Wonders are, it's possible one, or one of those was destroyed, but this is the only one we know for sure was destroyed. And I say, I say probably because, yeah. We're not sure. But in in, in in a way, this is a reverse of the real world because in the real world, only one of the original seven ancient wonders of the world stands. It happens to be the oldest one, the Great Pyramid. But in our case, we have only one of them destroyed rather than, the, than and, all but one. And to be clear, it wouldn't have been destroyed, we don't think, when he visited it. True, true, Technically true, true. Technically possible. No, I don't think possible at all. Well, based on what he said about it, I don't think it was destroyed. Yeah, I don't either. And... Thinking ahead, though, the wall might come down during the books. So it might be one that is now down. It's not currently down, but by the time the series is over, maybe two of the wonders are destroyed. And who knows? Maybe another one. I mean, we've pointed out that we're in a new age of gods and wonders. It's like the age of heroes come again. A time for wonders to rise and fall, perhaps, potentially. So we'll see about that. Well, Lomas's work might be a snapshot of a time before a new era. And that's makes it even more special which helps it preserve the memory of what things were there and in wonders made by man we have perhaps one of the only uh writings in westeros in you know the common tongue about this palace of a thousand rooms which will fade from world memory if people don't record it right now, we know this is the, also perhaps the one we know the least about. It's just the Palace of the Thousand Rooms. It's fancy. It was amazing. But like, in what way? <laughs> it's the mark of a high civilization. Honestly, this one, if you compare it to the real world, George likes to go big. The wall is maybe unrealistically large. But a thousand rooms, that's not, that's not that big for, for a palace compared to the real world. I mean, it's not small by any means. Like the ancient royal palace of Knossos on Crete was started in 2000 BC and reached its peak in 1500 BC. And it had 1300 rooms. I mean, and that's, that's 1500 BC. So they were small rooms. As <laughs> <laughs> they were rooms fit for Cretans. But if you look at the square <laughs> you look every at, closet, it, they were really cheating. It, yeah. You look at the square footage of the palace with a thousand rooms. It's bigger and better than every other palace you think of. Just, it's, it's, <laughs> Sean, they don't cheat in Crete. <laughs> 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 uh, so Mary Renault, an author I've referred to a few times, shout her out again. She depicted this ancient royal palace of Knossos in her his historical fiction novel, The Bull from the Sea, which I've read, along with its it's a sequel. The Bull from the Sea is a sequel to The King Must Die, which, of course, I've read that, too. Both novels follow the life of Theseus, the, the legendary mythical king Theseus. So, uh. Really good. She does a really good job of drawing out the super ancient Greek world with that. And in, and in other her other works as well, where she mostly writes about ancient Greece. So the royal quarter of the city of Alexandria 
was said by the geographer, ancient geographer Strabo, to be quite literally a quarter of the city. <laughs> Normally when you hear the word quarter, quarters, it's a living space. It's not actually one fourth. But in this case, it really was one fourth of the whole city, the royal city. So the people get one three quarters of the city. The royal palace alone accounts for a quarter of Alexandria. That's a huge amount of the city. Uh, Hadrian, who has also come up a lot in the last few weeks because uh, of his wall and stuff like that. He had a villa of over 30 buildings on 250 acres. But there's not a room count because it's actually not excavated. It's still unexcavated to this point. So we don't know how many rooms there are, but it, uh, it could easily be more than a thousand rooms. Maybe not. The current Royal Palace of Madrid has 3,418 rooms. It's a tourist site. It's not really used as a royal palace. I mean, the king of Spain doesn't have a lot of power these days. But there is a king of Spain. <laughs> or is it a queen? I forget. Anyway, they do have a royal family of Spain still. It's so crazy to think about that construction. Like what, what it would take to piece that together and to maintain it. And if you visited, I don't know, maybe some of the rooms are just empty. Stored <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just trying to think how long it would take to just go in each room. If you could just get from one room to the next in one minute each. It would take you days and days. You can, know? Yeah, can you imagine living in a place where you haven't been in all the rooms? <laughs> you know, I've lived this place 20 years and there's rooms I've never seen. There's rooms I don't even know about. Like, <laughs> Yeah, just it's a work. It, it's a world wonder just to draw the blueprints for that place, <laughs> let alone the actual place. There's also the... Oh, yeah, but wait, there's more, yeah. <laughs> I guess it would be like if you went to 600 homes and went in every room of those homes, you know <laughs> yeah, what I right? mean? Yeah. Like if, you split, if you split that by homes. five rooms in a house, which is really small, actually. But regardless, it would be it would be going on a survey of a lot of homes. And that's a great segue to this next example, which is the Forbidden City of China, which is considered a palace complex, even though it's a city. It's called the Forbidden City because it's, like it's, it's the emperor's like domain. But it's it's got... N Thousands of buildings, like thousands of buildings at 9,999 9, rooms, which I'm, appears to be intentional. Like we're, we're not going to go. We're going to keep it one below 10,000. I don't know <laughs> why, but it's a very specific number. Uh, the large George messed up. <laughs> George, George didn't Use write the, the forbidden city. In the living room in that one building. <laughs> <laughs> and then Weiyang Palace, which was built by Emperor Gao Zhu in 200 BC, was the largest ever. It was 11 times the size of Vatican City and seven times this Forbidden City, which has 9,999 rooms. It was destroyed, though. Currently, one of the best matches for the Palace of a Thousand Rooms is the Potala Palace in Tibet, which has exactly 1,000 rooms. So there you go. Palace of a Thousand Rooms. It used to be the winter residence of the Dalai Lama and was included on a list of new seven wonders. So some people consider Potala Palace uh, a, modern wonder of, a modern wonder of the world, although it's not... It wasn't built you know, recently, but it's not ancient either. Did you ever Relatively consider? Modern, yeah. Did you ever consider that he got it wrong? This was a palace with a thousand brooms. <laughs> it's a very clean place. Yeah. yeah. It's a witch's palace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this would have been an interesting visit, unlike a lot of the other ones for Lomas. Uh, it's not so straightforward. In some ways it is, because back when he was traveling, he could probably just have gone to Kohor and taken the Valyrian Road east to Sarnath, you know, before the Dothraki were overrunning the area. So it might have been relatively simple, even though it would have been a very long journey, a lot longer than getting to the wall, even if you're considering starting at, like, Old Town to the wall. Like, I think Old Town to the wall is probably, no, it's, eh, cohort of Sarnath is not as far as Old Town to the wall, but anyway, it's, it's very long. And Lomas must have had a lot to write about that, like Sarnor as well, as when he wrote about Yi-T and... Karth, Sarnor would have been, a, he, he probably compares all these places and, and we don't know which he thought was the fanciest or, or most impressive and whether even Valyria would have been in the mix for that. But it's a sure thing that he wrote about it because he went there. And this is actually kind of ominous. This one might have some foreshadowing to it. Remember how Sarnath was destroyed, which is that the Dothraki pulled a, a maneuver like they did a feigned retreat and suckered the Sarnor army into a trap and destroyed it and then destroyed Sarnath and well, Sarnor and then all the you know surrounding region that they hadn't already destroyed. I kind of think this might be foreshadowing what happens to Highgarden. Highgarden is to me the closest thing to Sarnor. 
the kingdom sort of a fancy long running well built beautiful uh very susceptible to burning <laughs> you know it's just garden i mean it's full of trees and greenery and you know danny is not gonna have the tyrells on her side i don't think and there could be battles in that area yeah like this high garden could be a thing of the past just as the wall might be or in part so there's a planting my flag there Next time someone gets to ask George a question, they should ask him how many rooms are in High Garden. <laughs> Is it a thousand? Yeah. yeah. Actually, you know, Ashea and I have tried to make a an art of what questions we can ask George R. Martin. We've had some success over the years, and I want this is one I thought of during this episode. Maybe he would answer. How, did Lomas Long try to go to Valyria? That might be like within the range of something he would. It's not that spoilery, or it's not spoilery at all. Really, he might be willing to answer. Yeah. Yes, I am quite decided that the next time I get to ask George a question, I'm going to ask him something about Lomas Longstrider. Cool. Um, I, I, like you said, we've made an art of it, so I will workshop it for quite a while before I'm at a Q and A. It's like you have to be so precise with your words. He like, so <laughs> he wheedles out of every little thing. So yeah, you have to be very precise. So yeah, like do you, like. Yeah, I, I, I would tweak it maybe for sure. Like, do you do you think Lomas would have gone? I don't know. I would have. I would. Be very specific. Maybe it's best to it. just go straight forward. Did Lomas Longstrider go to Valyria? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <You're> like, mm. <laughs> when it was before the Doom, before the Doom. Did he go to Valyria before the Doom? Because he, he could just try to, that's how he weasel out. Well, no, it was, he, it was destroyed. Well, that at least would tell us that. Anyway, let's talk about the next one. The Long Bridge of Volantis. Quote. In time, the lawless city on the West Bank became such a cesspit of crime and depravity that the Triarchs had no choice but to send their slave soldiers across the Rhoyne to restore order and some semblance of decency. Strong tides and treacherous shifting currents made the crossings difficult, however. So, after some years, the Triarch, Velasso the Munificent, commanded that a bridge be built across the Rhoyne. Those same tides and currents and the river's width, made the building an epic task, requiring more than 40 years and many millions of honors. Triarch Velasso did not live to see what he had wrought, but once completed, the long bridge had no rivals save for the Bridge of Dreams in the Roynar festival city of Croyane. Strong enough to support the weight of a thousand elephants, or so it is claimed, the Long Bridge of Volantis stands today as the longest bridge in all the known world. And I, and I want to say a moment, the art that we have on screen is by Christina K., uh, Sugar Light Art there, um, who is often in our live stream chat. She did this for us years ago for the Lomas Longstrider episode we were working on, and... Uh, finally, we are debuting this art from her, which is lovely. Uh, yeah, Christina. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is very nice. Yeah, this 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 episode has some great ones, and this is this is definitely near the top, if not the top. It's forty years is a, a time we've seen before. It's the also the length of time it took to build Heron Hall, and some of those other times where it says two or three generations to build it. That could be forty years ish. The mention of the Bridge of Dream here is really interesting because it seems to indicate that the time the Long Bridge was built, the Bridge of Dream was not broken because when Lomas Longstrider went to see the Bridge of Dream, it was broken. There were stone men already on it. The fogs and humors were already there. So this he wouldn't have been able to make that comparison in his lifetime because he didn't see a complete uh, Bridge of Dreams. It was it was quite destroyed. But it is bring it does bring us back to our discussion about Tyrion and and imagining what the Roinar was like. And if we were doing an all-time wonders of Essos and Westeros, that some of these things would be included because before they were destroyed, they, they sound like they would have been more wondrous than some of the things that are still around now. Now, it's a bit ironic. With almost everything in Volantis, the Long Bridge, is it's linked to the dependence on slavery. And it's very much a, a thing that enables travel and trade now and it's probably a good thing mostly 
But at the time, it was purely just as an extension of Vol- Volantis's authority, and they were just trying to dominate the other side, the West Bank, as it's called over here, because it was there was a city there, and it was destroyed by Valyria, and before it, the rest of the North was destroyed, before the rest of the, the full destruction of the Roinar came later. So that shows how it was sort of a military purpose originally, a dominance purpose of the empire, an imperial purpose maybe is the best way to put it. Now, there is no empire. Volantis is, wants to be an empire, but they're not. <laughs> you know, they can, they can dominate their neighbors, but they can't really go that far. So they do have the, the, the region that the bridge leads to, they do have control over, but it isn't, it's still different than its original purpose in that it's being used for so much more than just that. It's it's a mostly a commercial thing now. Like there's when we see the Long Bridge when Quentin's on it, there's merchants set up on it on its sides. It's just like wall to wall businesses and and stuff happening. So it's definitely far beyond just a military thing now. But that is what got it built in the first place. This one, like a lot of the like um like Karth, or even easier than Karth to get to. In fact, he may have gone to Volantis on his way to Karth because it's just the southern coast there of uh, of Essos and lots of ships going from Volantis to wherever and up the Rhoyne. Like he may have gone to Kohor, then down the river to, to Volantis. This could have been on one trip. Our best real life comparison might be the Golden Gate Bridge, but keep in mind that the Golden Gate Bridge is a suspension bridge, which is not at all. There's no such thing as a suspension bridge in Westeros or Essos. There also aren't Valyrian dragon roads in the real world. So there's, but they both have technologies that (laughs) don't exist on the other side of the parallel. The Golden Gate Bridge was built in 1937. Uh, At the time, it was the longest and tallest suspension bridge in the world. It's no longer either. And uh, the longest is in Turkey tallest uh, though sean you think that might be wrong it's a there's different standards there's like length and whether it's a suspension bridge or not so you think the longest total the actual longest bridge in the world is in china whereas the longest suspension bridge might be in turkey i think that's that might be it yeah i'm a little less sure of the longest suspension bridge but i know the longest bridge it's over a hundred miles long it's so crazy it goes from bang from shanghai to beijing 102 miles that is crazy that's- preposterous to me um one reason the golden gate bridge is so well known is because it it was for it's kind of like the empire state building it was for so long the biggest one it was for like 50 ish years yeah and then all of a sudden for one reason or another technology and needs of transportation like every other year a new one gets built that outdoes it but for the long long time it's interesting that the first bridge ever built over a mile long was in 1884 and it was Six miles long. <laughs> Whoa, so that's just yeah. one. Like, we're going to shatter the record. Oh. Uh, interestingly enough, it, it goes it just a waterway, probably to transport goods, maybe in the early days of steel and railroads. And hmm. uh, But uh, but I, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, but yeah, the tallest bridge, they, they some measurements are like from the base of the structure to the height of the structure versus from the platform that you travel on to the ground underneath. Like, those are slightly different measurements and uh, there's lots of different ways you can measure a bridge but the golden gate is probably the most iconic in the world and that chinese one is definitely the longest yeah it might be in time the chinese one might overtake the golden gate but yeah the for the longest time the golden gate and probably still holds the title it's probably going to lose that title but it's the most photographed bridge at least at least to like westerners we don't we don't know for sure about that but it's another one where the natural beauty of the area really enhances the 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 whole picture, the whole package. Uh, getting back to the Long Bridge, it's one thing that helps stand out about it is that it's one of the ones that we actually see. Some of these other ones we don't see. We've several that we've talked about. We've only briefly seen or don't see at all. And some of the ones that we haven't gotten to, we won't see or, or maybe or haven't seen and may not ever see. Such as the Bells of Norvos, which is next up. Quote, No account of Great Norvos is complete without a mention of the city's three bells whose peals govern every aspect of city life, telling the Norvashi when to rise, when to sleep, when to work, when to rest, 
when to take arms, when to pray, often, and even when they are and even when they are permitted to have carnal relations, rather less often, if the tales be true. Each of the bells has its own distinctive voice, whose sound is known to all true Norvashi. The bells bear the names Noom, Nara, and Nile. So three N's. It's our second set of three. Karth's triple walls, Norvas's three bells. Yeah. Now, this is interesting. We talked about how it, these things would have seen, been seen when you approach the city. This would be different because he would hear it. Instead of seeing it, he would hear it. And that's a, so it's a different sense that's being sort of, uh, well, hit with wonder. You'd be like, wow, that's really loud and clear from really far away. And because they ring co- often, it covers every aspect of city life. They ring frequently. There's, there's basically no chance he wouldn't have heard them coming up. Uh, it's also not that hard to get to Cor- uh, to, to Norvas. It's, it's on the Rhoyne, you know, so not super remote. It's one of the uh, nine free cities. Uh, and he probably heard about these bells in advance. They're probably somewhat famous. Bells are very often associated with religion. There's a long history in the real world from a variety of places all over east, west, north, south that bells are associated with prayer or with, you know, waking up in the morning or, you know, or warning the city of defenders. There's the, the, the bell of the Malisters that warns when the um, ironborn are coming, right? That's a good example. Now that one's not religious. That's pure defense, but a lot of them have more than one purpose. And in this case, you have three different bells that, you know, maybe two of them ringing at one time means one thing. Maybe one of them ringing alone means one thing. Maybe all three of them ringing together. So there's like, they can do harmony and melody. And so they, they just, he, George has taken this concept and built on it by adding just basic musical concepts that allows a lot more options to, you've already got rhythm and tone. Now you've got multiple tones, multiple rhythms. So it just adds so much more to it. It's like, it's like one instrument versus three, right? <laughs> you can do so much more with that. The largest real life bell ever known is the great bell of Damazidi. It was 300 tons and made of copper, gold, and silver. The king uh, of Myanmar gave it to the Shwedagon pagoda of Dagon. Dagon, not like, not Lovecraft's Dagon, <laughs> but this is the most sacred Buddhist pagoda in Myanmar. And legend says it was built when the Buddha was alive 2,500 years ago. So that's that's pretty impressive. Now, here's a little story and a story in reverse. The Portuguese warlord Philip de Brito sacked this pagoda and tried to steal the bell, this 300-pound bell. <laughs> yeah, he's like, let me let's run off with that, shall we? But he intended to melt it down to make cannons, but the boats he tried to carry it off with sank, and it's still in the Bago River to this day, that bell. Like, good luck getting that out of there. 300 ton. You said 300 pounds. Did I really? Ton. Oh, my oh, God. Yeah. yeah. 300 <laughs> tons. Yeah. 300 pounds is nothing, right? It's like 300 pounds. Like, come on. That's like a person, you know, <laughs> like a large person, right? <laughs> yeah. 300 tons. So the reverse part of the story is the Australian Bell Old Pumerin. It's It was made after Vienna repelled a Turkish Muslim siege in the year 1683. They captured 200 of the invaders' cannons and made a bell from it. So you have this this mercenary warlord who wanted to make a bell into cannons, and these guys m- made cannons into a bell. They did, did it in reverse. And it's that's the bell Old Pumerin. It, old Pumerin, unfortunately, is no longer around. It was destroyed, and now they have New Pumerin. They made a new one. Uh, in Austrian, it's something like Josefinische Glocke. I don't, I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation, but I love that because it's Glock. It's like people talk about Glocks, you know, like there's a lot of rap lyrics. You mentioned a Glock and maybe some other places, you know, and it's like pull out the Glock. It's like, yeah, I pull out my 300, my 200 cannon sized Glock, you know, like <laughs> your gun is small <laughs> compared to that. There's a bell from 771 uh, Common Era. Uh, that's 25 tons. The bell of King uh, Seongdok. That's in South Korea. And there's the great Mingun bell. Also in Myanmar, something about Myanmar and bells. They love their bells in Myanmar. <laughs> it's the largest in the world recently, but the Chinese surpassed it with the Bell of Good Luck, which is inside the Foquan Temple, which is located near the aforementioned Spring Temple Buddha, which is that 420-foot copper statue that is uh, among the tallest in the world. 
So again, you see the association with religion. The bell is associated with that Buddha. So boom. Uh, yeah, uh, Nina points out as well what is probably closer to George's personal experience, life experience with religion, being a Catholic person, a person who was raised Catholic. He's not a practicing Catholic. He was, ra he was raised Catholic. And prayer bells are a big thing in Catholic religion. And of course, they are in other things, right? Bells in the, these examples we've given. We've got bells in a pagoda, bells in a cathedral, bells in a temple, like all these different. And there's surely other ones. We didn't mention like mosques, but Muslims use prayer bells too. There's just bells are a big thing for that. And uh, Nina wonders if those are like Norvashi gods, Num, Nara, and Nael, or named after them. It's mm -hmm. a really, I really like that idea. It's entirely possible. We don't know a lot about the worship of, we know they're a very religious society, but we don't really have a big, a clear picture on what that religion is. Like the details of it are kind of sparse to us. Nina also notes how similar they are to Kiev and Rus or Muscovite, like some of these uh, Russian uh, influenced religious sites. Bearded priests are certainly a, a big association there, which is a, obviously a, a big part of Norvos. I wonder how much that works for foreigners, right? Like <laughs> the quote of Shea read, it was like, well, they, it tells them when to do everything, basically, like all the basic human functions. I wonder if there's a bell for using the bathroom. I mean, geez. So it's like, nope, you can't go until the bell rings. Like, man, I really need to go. <laughs> you wonder if like Lomas, like, does that work for foreigners? Like, does the bell apply to him? He's like, you can only eat during, or does that only apply to people who follow their religion? Like, yeah, it would be something he would have probably written about how that, you know, the inner workings of how that applies to, to people who aren't locals. When in Rome, when in Norvos, <laughs> yeah. what does the Norvosi do? <laughs> yeah, seriously. I wonder if he let his beard grow out a little more, or if he had <laughs> one in the first place. I don't know. And that's, that's, it's something that it has in common with the Titan as a noisemaker. The Titan's the other one that can actually make noise, right? And it, but the Titan only roars on special occasions, like feast days and victory and things like that, the unmasking, whereas the bells are like every, every day, several times a day. <laughs> so, oof, that's a lot. Okay. Those are the seven we know. Time to get into the unknown wonders made by man number eight and number nine in no particular order. We're just going to get, we're going to, we're going to list off all the ones we think are candidates with brief descriptions. And then Ashea, Sean, myself will weigh in on what we think they are. Plus Nina has added hers as well. So we'll have all, all four of us will weigh in with what our guesses are. So none of these have been particularly remote so far. None of them are like, wow, how did he get to that? Here, it gets a little trickier with that. Some of these are just as easy, like some of them are in Westeros, but some of them are particularly remote. And that adds to the difficulty of wondering if he actually went there. And I was like, well, that might be what, maybe he didn't go there because it's so far away. We'll start with the mazes of Lorath. We had a whole episode on Lorath. It's one of the nine free cities. We talk about the mazes and the maze makers quite a bit. The trick here is, are they man-made? The maze makers were probably human, but they might not have been. They might have been some other species, which is a semantic trick here, right? <laughs> like, well, they definitely aren't gods either. That's the, the two categories that Lomas gives us is man-made and natural, basically. And well, this is not this isn't either. If it's if it's not man-made, it certainly isn't natural. So well, my it, was, question it was constructed. For you in our um our p potential third Lomas episode where we talk about unnatural wonders. Would the mazes of Nor Lorath be on that list for you? Would you include it? I think so. I think we would have to include it probably, but I sort of have it as my honorable mention for like my 10th choice for here because I'm not sure. Like I think if Lomas considered the man-made, it's hard not to include them. But he, if he omitted them, that would be wise that he didn't consider them man-made or... or I don't know. It's it's tough. It's very tough. It's kind of semantics. So you're but but again, Ashea brings up the the need for this alternate categorization. And you'll see there's this isn't the only one that kind of fits in that alternate categorization of like, well, man made? Natural? Like the Shadowlands are like, well, that's not natural. That seems very supernatural. So that might be so it doesn't really fit. It's wondrous, it's amazing, but it doesn't it's not a I don't think it fits into either category necessarily. The wall seems supernatural to me and also may be supernatural. How yeah. much Lomas realizes or believes that it is, he put it on his list of man-made, but. And you're right to bring that up because some of these, there is that overlap. Like there is, there's absolutely, there's magic in the wall. 
That's not doubtable. But is that what enables it to stand 700 feet tall? Probably not, you know, it, but, it, but it definitely adds to the wondrousness of it that the dead can't pass and that dragons can't pass or, or whatever, whatever exactly how it works. Uh, so, yeah, that's tricky. And the other thing about- say all the art on the walls of Karth were made through magic. Oh, okay. Okay. Does that mean the walls don't count? The glory of the city? Good point. Also, did the magic just randomly happen one day, or did a magician have to stand there? That's and still man made. And have a vision of what the mm. art would be. It's okay. still man made, right? Humans using magic is the, that would, I, I could see why you'd call yeah. that man made. But in the case of something like the shadow, we don't know the origin of that magic. So that's like, well, it could be, man. It could be a magical accident done by humans, right? The doom of the current state of Valyria, you could call that maybe. Like the, the magical fallout of Valyria, that you could call that man-made maybe, you know? So, but that's the, that's the trick. Like, hmm, we, we, we were missing some details. That's part of the fun, though. Uh, one of the other interesting things about the Maze of Lorath is it might be the oldest. It might be older than any of these. It might even be older than the Five Forts, which is wild to think about because those are super old. Uh, but, and like the, the beginning, the High Tower might have been started 10,000 years ago. So like, if this is older than that, that's really something. Now, I we don't even know for sure that he went to Lorath, but it seems likely because of this feature and because he seems to have gone so many places and it's not super remote. I mean, Lorath is... He's right by it when he's in Norvos. Yeah, yeah. It's not even that far away. And he's Bravos, in Bravos too. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's right by there. So I suspect he went there and it just it's just not one of the things that we get. We know for sure there's more that George wrote about Lomas that wasn't included in the world of ice and fire. Perhaps this is one of those things. The high tower. Let's talk about the high tower. We've already talked about it a little bit because we framed it as a potentially the a thing that he left off the list because he was used to it. A place he may have been born because of all the books there. Also because it has such a great real world parallel that we mentioned the lighthouse of Alexandria, which is also a lighthouse like, like the high tower. And there, they also have the association of the knowledge there. The lighthouse of Alexandria coexisted with the Great Library of Alexandria, just like Old Town has the Citadel along with the High Tower. So, very cool. We know the High Tower is the tallest tower in the known world. That by itself is very impressive. We don't actually know how tall it is, though. It's just more than the wall. So, the wall is 700 feet. It's just more than that. We don't know how much more, though. And part of the difficulty there probably is that the High Tower has been added to. It's changed. It hasn't had a static height. Although maybe it has been for a while. Uh, for all we know, it hasn't changed in a century or even more. Uh, but that's pretty pretty cool. It must have an amazing view. We have not been inside it. It's amazing we've been near it, We've but but not in it, which is kind of interesting in that we've been, you know, we've seen the triple walls of Karth. <laughs> we've seen some of these really remote ones, but we haven't been inside the high tower, which is just right there in one of the biggest population centers of, 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 of Westeros. The tallest tower... Not tallest building on Earth right now is the Tokyo Sky Tree, which is 2,080 feet or 634 meters. The tallest building is the Burj Khalifa, which is uh, 2,717 feet. Um, and these two, like... It's crazy. That's like half a mile. <laughs> it's so crazy tall. how tall yeah. those are. <laughs> yeah, it's almost literally... It's almost exactly half a mile. You're right. Like, isn't a mile 5,400 feet? Something like that. I forget. Yeah, 5,200. Yeah, yeah it's, you're right. So I think I'm a little over half. That's, that is crazy. Yeah. So, like several of these, it's it's changed over time. Like, obviously, the Tokyo Sky Tree hasn't been the tallest for all that long. But the Wall and the High Tower, they probably have held, like, the High Tower has held this title probably for a huge amount of time. Unless something else was taller and fell. Like, maybe the Sarnath, you know, something like that. It's possible. Maybe something in Valyria. Valyria is very possible. But not anymore. So... And it started as a 50-foot wooden tower. So it's definitely like it wasn't... Obviously, Lomas didn't live that long ago when it was, you know, the dawn of man, the dawn age we're talking about, but super old. Yeah, Sarnath... Sorry, Sarn is, oh. uh, I'm sorry. How tall is the high tower? We don't know. It's not Wait, given. It's like, just taller I, than the wall. It's more than 700 feet tall. That's all we know. I, I did a Google search, and I, so I don't know how where this... I, this maybe shouldn't count, but it says 800 feet. So I don't know where don't they're that, getting that from. I don't. But, uh, I think that's just a guesstimate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But part of why I bring this up, and we'll get there, but the uh, 
I mean, do you think it's 10%, 20, 30% higher than the wall? Do you think it's a thousand feet? Well, I think the guess there was that it's a hundred feet taller than the wall. It's just like, is that a rough guess or is it actually 200? I don't think it's 500 feet taller, but I think it's within 200 feet taller than the wall. I'm bringing it up because the forts are a thousand feet tall. <laughs> There's five of them and they're all yeah. taller. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's so insane. And the five forts. we can believe that. Assuming that's true. So. Right. Which And does that count as a tower? I guess not. This is probably what it's saying. So. Yeah. Like but the, I think it's easier to make a tower tall than it is to make a building tall. Yes. And especially because these aren't buildings designed for heart. They're, they can hold like 10,000 men each or something, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 these aren't just like barely getting this narrow tip to a super high. <laughs> these are massive at the base. So. Yep. So it might have started more like the five forts when it was a fortress made of black stone because that's the base of the high tower. Now, it's nowhere the size of one of the five forts, but it's made of this very mysterious black stone, the fused black stone or that, that so we associate with the Great Empire of the Dawn and or the Deep Ones and or the Maze Makers uh, or maybe even Valyria. So ah, a lot of ancient mysteries wrapped into one location because it's also associated with brandon the builder <laughs> so it's just like this all the old stuff all the old building people all the old civilizations are associated with old town one way or another and with the high tower there's even stories of ancient dragons there and a trading post where valyrians and other races would come to maybe trade with the children of the forest i mean there's a lot of ancient history here that we don't have a lot of depth on just tales and, and rumors but it sounds like this is a hotbed and it would make sense for there to be for something to be recognized as wondrous there if even if not the high tower maybe the whole city but no, i think the high tower it's a strong strong candidate nina says is she taller than the wall it's hard for her not to include it that's that's her logic and i, I tend to agree with that it's it's hard not to include it <laughs> i like that logic because that means you should include the five fours so. yeah, yeah yeah i think my own my argument against high tower i still argue i think I, as we'll say i think i'm still gonna say i think it is the high tower is one of the eight one of the nine wonders um the argument against it is one sean brought up um which is that if you grew up in the shadow of the high tower is it still wondrous to you it's funny that you brought it up sean because i read a, a really interesting academic paper that brought up that same concept at that that's the library um of alexandria and the lighthouse uh were not on original one lists of wonders of the world because they grew the, the person writing it was living around there so so that's where that concept came from it's really neat to see that a real person that named wonders really did that yeah, they really <laughs> the did thing that you were describing they're like this is nothing and then other people were like no no this is a wonder though man <laughs> like, oh, okay all right you got me you convinced me yeah <laughs> That, that also requires Lomas to be from Old Town or near Old Town. At least, yeah, too. which right. is reasonable, but by no means a, a sure thing. These next two are very familiar to us all, uh, but they're a little confusing in how to categorize them because they're both man-made. There's aspects of them that are man-made, but the natural element is potentially the more important part. First one of them is Casterly Rock. It's similar to the arguments for the mazes in some way, which is that they're impressive, but the natural start to it all might be more impressive. The rock itself is so unusual with all that gold being so tall in an area that's more hilly than mountainous. And in this amazing natural harbor with the, the wide open cave system and all that, it's the Lannisters and Casterlies before them repurposed it and did a lot of carving, which made it more wondrous. But I think it's pretty wondrous without the man-made aspects. So this is where the debate gets framed as well. The rock is a great candidate, but for which list? Yeah, Probably I, more the second one, I think. Yeah, I lean towards a natural wonder. I think I, if someone argued for it as man-made, I would, I would see it. But I think if we're already bursting at, at the limits of trying to come up with the, at, at fit the two spots, might as well just put cast the rock in natural wonders and make it easier for ourselves. Yeah, I agree. It, it is simpler to put it there because, yeah, it's hard to put it above the high tower of the five forts, which I think are two of our better candidates. And there's other ones, too, that are maybe just as good as Castle Rock, if not to the level as other ones. And yeah. What do you think, Sean? Unsuspicious of it making either list. I think that 
the man-made portion of it is hard to witness and be in awe of, right? Mm. From the outside, it's a big mountain, but then you go in and now you're just in a cave or a hallway. Here and there, there might be some luxuriously decorated room, but there's thousand decorated rooms and, you know, like it's hard for any one piece of it to really jump out and be that outstanding compared to the other things that it's competing okay. with. Same thing, even as a natural wonder, there's bigger mountains, you, you know, like it's, you know. Yeah. Maybe as an individual mountain, that is another thing in the real world. They measure mountain heights, not just by uh, elevation from sea level, but also the relative height of what's around it. You know? mm-hmm. But neither of those get included in the marvels of the natural world. Like Mount Everest isn't one of them. You know, yeah. mean, the Grand okay. Canyon is kind of the opposite of a mountain, but it's not one of them either. So Some people say it is. but I guess depends on weight list. Yeah. Okay, yeah, but you're right. But you're right. That's not a universal thing. So good point. The other candidate here, which has a lot in common with the rock for similar reasons, is the Erie. Extremely beautiful both by itself and because of the unbeatable views, but it's the natural elements that really make it probably. even Maybe even more so than Cashley Rock because it's probably less work was done to make the Erie, though it's more visually stunning from a distance. It's, it's the imported marble. It's beautiful to behold. It's atop the Giant's Lance, which is the tallest peak in the Mountains of the Moon in the Vale of Aaron. It's one of the highest peaks in all of Westeros, probably. And they built this tall tower, se- series of towers atop of it. It took several generations to build. It's not the tallest building, but it's definitely the highest up, I think. At least amongst maybe maybe some watchtower here or there might be higher, but nothing of, subs- nothing of, of uh, you know, acclaim. It's also, it, it meets a standard I was mentioning earlier is that it's how spectacular of a, a, a build or whatever it is for how remote of a location. Mm-hmm. Like, how could you even build that? How, that, you know, you're already on this mountain. It's hard to get there. Just a, a skilled climber on their own. How did you get enough climbers with enough skill to get all the material at that that adds to it for me i think maybe even more so than castle rock although i'm still suspicious i still don't know if it if i i don't think i count it i think there's other things that are i tend to agree potentially more impressive i think it would be like if we did a top 20 it would make it but i don't think it's yeah. in the top nine and maybe even top 10 or it know, might like, it yeah. might could be 10th or yeah it's it's very impressive there's no doubt it's another one of the ones that we get to see we get to see a pretty good amount of it we get to see the approach to it as well not just inside but like they see it from a distance they're like whoa that's it's pretty impressive. We see the climb there. We see how remote it is. We see how difficult it is to reach, uh, even though it's the, ho- the home of one of the great houses, or at least the <laughs> summer home of one of the great houses. They don't live there in winter. It is kind of small. It's the smallest of the great castles. That is an argument against it. And uh, like I said before, one of the things that makes it so impressive is just it's so the beauty of the the view being up there it's an incredible view of Alyssa's tears and the valley below it might be the most beautiful natural view that we know of in the entire world of westeros and, and essos but and planetos but uh, so that <laughs> you know that but that that kind of argument is something you would say about natural wonders and not about a castle it's not the castle part that's that's you could just stand up on that peak and look down and you would get that same effect you know <laughs> it's just nice to have a castle there too <laughs> Something to potentially parallel this to is the uh, Christ the Redeemer statue in Brazil. Oh yeah, that the one that's it's, enormous, it's, isn't it? It well, it is, but it's nowhere near as big as those other statues. It's oh, smaller yeah. than a Statue of Liberty. But to get it built on that mountain peak, you know, it appears to be taller than it is. Jungle, mm. and then you have this massive statue there. Like, how did you build that there? That's a, and it does get included in the modern list, the modern marvel. Yeah, so. yeah, it's it's a it's a big one. That's also one that has incredible views. Like you, if you were up in the spot where it is, the statue itself is, I haven't been there, but I've seen the, like people taking pictures from it. It's like, whoa, that's, that's awesome. You can see the, the coast and the, all the, the trees and everything, the city below. All right. So here's one that we, perhaps one we, that we may have debated the most offline here. This is the Great Pyramid of Geese. It's mentioned in the World of Ice and Fire app and in the book, but it's not confirmed as a wonder. We're not sure, but it's definitely discussed a lot. Here's a quote. The Great Pyramid of Marine had been built as an echo to the Great Pyramid of Geese, whose colossal ruins Lomas Longstrider had once visited. Like its ancient predecessor, whose red marble halls were now the haunt of bats and spiders, 
the Miranese pyramid boasted three and thir- boasted three and thirty levels, that number being somehow sacred to the gods of geese. It's hard not to miss the what can I say? Mm-hmm. I, I put an image of the Great Pyramid of Marine here. We don't have great imagery of of geese, um, one. So I figured this was the closest we could come to kind of capturing that. Right on. And it's hard to miss the real world parallel. Great Pyramid of Geese, Great Pyramid of Giza. <laughs> Pretty yeah. similar. They're very similar in age. The, uh, well, sort of, in, in a sense, the Great Pyramid of Giza is 4,600 years old. The Great Pyramid of Geese was destroyed 5,000 years ago. So <laughs> the destruction of the Great Pyramid came around the same time that the real world Great Pyramid was built. So the who knows how long the Great Pyramid of Geese stood before it was destroyed 5,000 years ago. But it's not clear just how destroyed it was. And this is p- part of our difficulty when we were debating this offline. We know Valyria, after the Fifth Giscari War, sacked and destroyed Old Gis, the city. And what damage they did to the Great Pyramid is unclear. It sounds like it's, it's unused because the population center nearby is gone. But how much actual destruction did they level on the pyramid itself? Well, it says there's still red marble halls that are the haunt of bats and spiders. So it clearly isn't fully leveled if there's some red marble halls that are still there. But does it still have its point? Does it still look like a pyramid? Or is it more like a some strange rhombus? <laughs> you know, That's a... <laughs> kind of what I figure is that, yeah, it doesn't have the 33 levels, but it might still have 20. It might still have 10. It, it still has enough to have multiple levels. It's not one level. I agree. Yeah, it sounds like it's not just the base only, you know. And even if it was just the base only, I kind of made this point before, that might be enough to envision the rest of it, especially if there's paintings and people to tell stories. But if there are multiple levels and some one side of it might be still hundreds of feet tall or something, especially when you consider in the real world, there are some time periods during the Renaissance when they were updating the seven wonders of the world and again there's no central body or scientific method to this but some of them included solomon's temple and noah's ark which they could not have possibly have ever seen so not not existing at all or being visible at all can still potentially make a list so the ruins being there especially if the ruins are still there to a certain extent and especially with the close parallels that george has created to the pyramids of giza and that you could infer what the size would be from marine too, right? Mm-hmm. There are other pyramids. Yeah. Too. All these things, it make it's a strong candidate for me. I, I I think it would be one of my final guesses if I was pinned down. Cool. Yeah, it is very impressive. And you wonder that Lomas would have probably tried to imagine what it was like as a whole. And you also wonder if he lived, if the Great Pyramid of Marine existed when Lomas went to visit this one, whether he could go to see it as a comparison. It was like, this is the one they built as an echo of the old one. And he would get an even better idea of what the old one looked like by seeing the new one because it's apparently built very similarly. And that also stands out because I don't think we have any other examples of rebuilt wonders. Like they're trying, they like, they built this one in honor of as a replica of the old one. I don't think any of the other ones we've listed have anything like that. Uh, maybe I'm missing something. I, I'm just now, this is just now occurring to me, so I didn't prepare that particular thought. But I think that's, uh, it's worth a mention. I think like a lot of these other ones, it's from a distance. It's like, wow, you could, you could see that and be like, oh my gosh, that's really big. Even if it's in partly in ruins, you'd still be able to see it from far away. He, how he got there is a Probably similar to a lot of these other ones. It's still it's still the southern coast of Essos. It's not that difficult to go to Old Geese um, by ship, okay. I don't think. My thoughts on that, on, on what you were saying about things being a replica or similar to another wonder. Yeah. I think the only one that I think, I don't think it's a replica at all, but the only one that comes to mind for me is that the question of whether the five forts or the wall predates one another. Oh. Two very different structures, but both used time. to keep things out, you know? They are like, yeah, they are like kind of similar parallels, but with some some things in reverse. But yeah, but and I don't know which same. And I don't know which one I think is more ancient. I kind of think five fourths is, but I don't. I really don't know, honestly. I, I I couldn't say. Let's move on to the next one. Um, actually, one other note about that. I would say he probably took ship. I did say that rather than 
crossing like the demon road or something like that. So that seems how he got to Slaver's Bay, because I imagine he didn't just see old geese, but it's possible he only did because maybe he didn't want to get enslaved. I don't know. <laughs> it's probably not that. He probably wasn't in that much danger of that, but it might be a reason to steer clear. The next one is interesting because it, in some ways it's more important than all the others, but it's maybe less wondrous. And these is the talking trees of the Summer Isles. We know for a fact that Lomas went there, he talked to their wise people, and he learned about this. These are a series of trees, and there's got to be a really huge number. We have no idea how many, but they're carved with the histories, laws, and commandments from their gods on them. There's also, some of these are, form, are carved in the form of song, and there's maps. So, like, whoa, this is like a vast trove of knowledge that's just carved onto trees. So, in some ways, it's got the same sort of value as the Citadel or any sort of ancient well, library. Well, I think of it as a counterpoint, like a mundane counterpoint to Werewoods and Green Seers, right? Ooh, yeah. Because in that case, they're actually just storing it in the trees, but in this case, like they're they're doing it's the same function but but just written there. I don't think it's magical in this it's case. It's the non-supernatural version of that. Y yeah. yeah. It's associated with the tree though. That's a great call. Yeah, I love that idea. And but it, but unlike some of the other ones, the reason maybe it's not a wonder, as much as this knowledge is like, wow, they were able to keep all this. It's really amazing. It's wonders. It's more valuable than a lot of these other things in terms of its its role in society. But it's not like you don't see it from a distance. You know, you don't sail up and be like, oh, what's that? You, you wouldn't only you don't kind of only be able to see it when you get close to it. Um, it's not an edifice. You know, it's not. So it also has that struggle of this is partly natural. You know, it's it's definitely the carvings are man made clearly, but you know, it's 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 a combo <laughs> like like some of these other ones. It makes it tricky to categorize, and it's also the only c candidate on this list that's constantly changing. Sure, all of these have had changes. Cashley Rock gets new tunnels. The Long Bridge gets new. I don't know businesses moving on and off of it. That's that's not a change to the structure necessarily, but it, you might count that as a change. Maybe some of these other places have added rooms or subtracted rooms. I don't know, but but this one is constantly they're adding new history, new law, whatever. Like that's this is an ongoing thing. But it probably isn't an engineering marvel. You know what I mean? Like that might be why it doesn't quite make the top 9. I don't know. I you try. You try typing. Oh, are we? Doing, I was saying you try writing all of your history on a tree, Aziz, and call that not <laughs> I an can't engineering. I do any of these things though. Yeah, call it an engineering <laughs> marvel. <laughs> like I wonder how they deal with logistically over time as the cheese as the trees grow. Do they get too tall to read what was written longer? And do they have some sort of ladder system to get up higher, or some way to control the growth? Well, or are they slow growing trees? No, no. Or? Actually, that's not how it works. We learned this when we talked about werewoods. That's why the face of the tree stays at the bottom. That's not how trees grow. Trees don't grow from oh, the base it like that. Extends up. From yeah. Above. So they might carve up higher, the but they but the history wouldn't like go up. <laughs> it wouldn't move up with it. It would stay at the base. Yeah. So that, that I'm glad you brought that up. We had the same thought process. That might be my favorite time. thing I've ever learned through doing our podcast. I always thought that of trees. Yeah, it was like, and, oh, okay. I forget why we learned that, but it was like an arborist that told, like someone that knew was like, oh, no, that's not how trees work. I'm like, okay, then. All right. Cool. We know now. Yeah. So yeah. the more you know, I honestly, knowledge is power. Yay. I honestly never second guessed it. I, I just either. thought they grew from the, I don't know. I don't know. I, I didn't second guess it at all. But it makes sense. Like. Like we have a tree flowers. out there on our backyard that's like leaning into our deck and it's got a carve out for that. And that has stayed the same spot. Like the tree has risen, but that hasn't. Yeah, you're, you're right. <laughs> it's in the exact same spot. So I, it does stand to reason with my own real world experience and yours. Uh, so, yeah. So the talking tree is worth a mention, but you can maybe see why it's maybe another top 20, but not top nine. But your mileage may vary. You know, these are we're guessing here. We don't this is not we're, we're not. Uh, we're not an authority. We're, we know we have we have strong opinions here. We have done a lot of work on this, but you know, we're just guessing. Uh, Yt. Let's talk Yt briefly. We talked Karth. We talked the potential of Valyria. We talked Sarnath. Yt deserves a mention. We'll talk about Yt a little more as well on the other episode because we'll have reason to. But he was extremely impressed by it. Said their cities are far grander than those of Westeros. What I wish he had done is compared the cities of Yt to Sarnor and Valyria, and that's I don't want Westerosi comparisons. We know those are like that's the one we need. The like equals like, not the, the you know like does not equal far away. 
he said even their ruins put ours to shame which is like ooh, dang <laughs> so yeah it is a much 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 older culture and we covered them separately in an episode with chris stewart of the history of china podcast who is a person that lives in china and and does the you know knows quite a lot about chinese history given his uh podcast and all and this is part of why Nina is on the five forts side as a wonder of the world, because he was awestruck by its marvels, yet nothing is on his list that we know of. Like what he's awestruck, yet nothing made the cut. Well, if the five forts made the cut, that would sort of solve that minor issue here. And the five forts would be a great way to show like, the capability of a culture we talked about hey this culture is proud of what they did here well what's more impressive than this <laughs> you know like these gigantic edifices which let's go ahead and talk about and here's one of the only cases where i could maybe see lomas including it without having been there but he might just have to verify this for with his own two eyes because it's like really is it really that big here's the quote I want to say I really don't like the idea of him including anything on the list that he has not seen with his own two eyes. That That's my take on it. Uh, I yeah, I, I, I kind of you know. I'm kind of with you there, but this is the one yeah. I'm willing to maybe maybe say otherwise on. Yeah, I don't like the idea of that, but I still think it might be the case here. here. Right on. All right, here's the quote. <laughs> no discussion of Yi T would be complete without a mention of the five forts a line of hulking ancient citadels that stand along the far northeastern frontiers of the Golden Empire. Between the Bleeding Sea, named for the characteristic hue of its deep waters, supposedly a result of a plant that grows only there, and the Mountains of the Morn. The five forts are very old, older than the Golden Empire itself. Some claim they were raised by the... Actually... Some claim they were raised by the Pearl Emperor during the morning of the Great Empire to keep the Lion of Night and his demons from the realms of men. And, indeed, there is something godlike or demonic about the monstrous size of the forts, for each of the five is large enough to house 10,000 men, and their massive walls stand almost a 1,000 feet high. Wait, wait. The beginning... Now, no. As Ashea said at the beginning, this one has a lot in common with the wall, and that's why we're finishing with it. So like a bookend, we started with the wall, we're going to finish with the five forts. Each one, as it says, monstrous in size, yet each seems to be carved from a single block, which is probably not the case. It's just some sort of technology or fusing the black stone stuff that he just doesn't have an explanation for. Almost certainly not carved from one solid slab. That's even crazier than magic, given magic exists in this world. <laughs> so if this is a, if this is the sort of fused stone that was made by dragons, like the Valyrian dragon roads, it was a different dragon riding culture because these forts predate Valyria for sure. It's not like maybe they pre predate Valyria. We're like ninety nine percent sure of that. It so that argues that this is at least as old as the wall and might be older. Yi-Ti has existed since the long night, and it seems like civilization dawned in the east sooner than in Westeros. Like, Westeros came, maybe came along later as a civilized place, given it was the haunt of children and, and giants and stuff before the first men came. Well, the first men came from Essos. That definitely shows that Essos had people before Westeros. So... Yi-T very possibly existed before the First Men came to Westeros. The Great Empire of the Dawn perhaps predates all that, which could mean the Five Forts are a lot older than the Wall, like potentially a thousand years or more. And as Sean said, almost a thousand feet high, that's 300 feet taller than the Wall, <laughs> which is George already said, that probably made the Wall too big. Well, what excuse does he have for this then? Because <laughs> this was 2014, so he had already decided that the Wall was too big. He's like, you know what? I'm going to go even bigger. Screw it. <laughs> and it's also worth noting that these forts, we don't know the exact dimensions, but the five of them and their surrounding... Oh, well, entrapments. Yeah. Are 300 miles across. Yeah. Right? So that 
Like, even if there were only seven, how far across is the wall? A hundred miles. So three times farther across <laughs> like, as a collective construction. Yes. Wait, wait, 300 miles. Sorry, 300 miles, 300 miles. It's, it's 100 oh, three, leagues. Oh, so 100 leagues, sim- 300 miles. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, so similarly yeah. as long, right? Yeah. Probably deeper, right? I don't know Probably how, deeper, deep, yeah. how wide the wall is from one side to the other, but it seems like these structures are at least similarly as deep. Yes. And they're not as continuously as tall, but they get to a greater height overall. And also it's worth noting, the wall isn't an even perfect 700 feet all the way across. You're right. It's higher it's feet at its highest point. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's higher when it like it's that's the, the the measure of the wall itself. But yeah, it gets a little higher when it goes over walls and or walls, hills and stuff like that. So yeah. this this is more like a desert region. So there's not as it, maybe the ground is a little flatter in general. But there's there's hills maybe and stuff like that. And yeah, we don't know if there's like a a, a wall that these forts are connected to. It doesn't look like that on the map. It just looks like there's forts there and. They're just spaced out, uh, uh, facing this region of the, the land of the Shrikes and all these crazy, creepy beasts that we hear coming out of. Very similar to the legionary standing on Hadrian's Wall that George was imagining is like, what's going to come out of this wasteland, this frozen? This is similar, except it's not a frozen wasteland. It's a desert wasteland, but has just as much, if not more, reputation for strange creatures that live out there lizard men which might just be humans wearing lizard scales we don't know winged men all sorts of crazy creepy stuff that's like you know edge of the map type descriptions that the five forts are holding back just like the wall is holding back the others but also things that are just like the free the free folk have a reputation that's undeserved like you hear like early on in a game of thrones you hear like oh they're drinking blood and you know enslaving people and all this stuff that isn't really true about the free folk and it's, it's you got to dial some of this back down too which is why Ashea made the good point is like he would have to verify this because like the shrikes and the lizard people like uh, so if they're exaggerating about that then why not exaggerate about the size of these buildings although it might be easier for him to accept it having seen the wall okay right? fair, point, fair point fair like, point yes. I have seen a 700 foot 300 mile long thing i guess it's guarding an expan dark expanse of, of unknown horrors yeah yeah you're right he would have already had that experience very good point what how many the, the wall has 14 towers 19 uh 19 no more towers. than 17 active at, at wherever active at one time okay all right so and so let's say each of them were manned by a thousand people yeah Isn't that reasonable mm, could be I, I think that might be on the high end because that would be as many people as two of the forts. Yeah, yeah. If on some level we're considering that that the maintenance of the population around the wall is part of its marvel, well, it would be multiplied by four or three or whatever. Yeah. For the uh, at least I think for the five forts. Now he wouldn't have seen that even if he did go there and see the forts. All those people wouldn't have been there. Yeah. But again, having seen that at the wall, he could imagine just like I see in the pyramids of marine. He could imagine what Geese would have been like. Maybe he didn't see it. Maybe he didn't name it. But <laughs> if, if I think even if everything we know about the five forts is cut in half, <laughs> it's not exaggerated by when they say it's almost a thousand feet and that doesn't mean 900, it means 600. Yeah. I still think the five forts would be one. Yeah. They're super the impressive. The only question is whether he saw it or needs to see it to count it. Yeah. Agreed. Maybe. Agreed. So it's it's a, it's a strong candidate. You can see why we've we've made our our point here, and uh, it's it's one of those where this is pretty easily the least likely for us to see <laughs> during the events of the Song of Ice and Fire, uh, but it's possible we hear about it. Like if the others are invading the wall, we might hear something you know it's ha- something's coming on the other side of the world as well yeah that might be a fun thing for george to do to be like yeah the line of night the other there, there's a connection there who knows probably not but it's a fun idea and it could happen and i i'm i like thinking about that i like the possibility yeah i'm more partial to the idea that it, they came out of that region they faced a similar threat to the others on that side of the world at a different point in time 
And that's uh-huh. not where it's going to happen now, but it has happened there in the that's past. That's a great idea. Like, the that's five we, forts might what we, be what the wall will look like after this books are over. When the wall's yeah. broken and no longer useful as a defensive thing, but it's still standing for the most part. Like, yeah. it's got chunks missing I guess or I whatever. Two, but Well, I have two questions. One, do, do we know for a fact that the wall is solid ice all the way through? Or, like, is there, like, a core of of, of There's a lot of rock. Stone? There's a lot of yeah, gravel you know, rock in it. So, like, yeah. the idea that, yeah, if all the ice melts, there's still, like, that. Anyways, one... But yeah, I think if you, I think the point, the place where we speculated most on this might be in our many faced Azor Ahai episode, Aziz. Maybe. I believe we speculated at length while. about this particular thing. Um, cause I think there's, it's, it's, there's so many parallels. There's so many, uh, myths about, about the savior during the long night in Essos and in this air er- and in these areas. I can't help but think that it had to happen as well on this side of the world. Yeah, I really like that idea. I mean, it's probably not, it's, this is probably going too far, but using Sean's idea of like the wall just, or your idea of the wall just melting and that showing that there would have, could have been something there that connected the, these castles. It's like these castles just sitting there facing this wasteland. Well, what if there was another edifice that they, that those fortresses were supporting that, is something like the wall of Westeros. Maybe not an ice wall, but something that's no longer standing. Who knows? And maybe an ice wall. Maybe the, t- maybe the climate changed so much that <laughs> they had an ice wall and well, that's where they got the idea for building the one in Westeros. Like, hey, they had one over there. Well, definitely changed a lot in that time because, I mean, we have the Bleeding Sea on its own. Like we, ha- we have the Great Sand Sea and we have multiple seas that are no longer seas there, right? Yeah, you're right. And the Silver Sea supposedly existed in, in yeah. the Dothraki Sea, which is even farther west. So, yeah, there's a lot of this stuff was underwater. So you're right that 10,000 years ago, the climate, the geography, a lot of things could have been substantially different in terms of what the world looked like, um, what the weather looked like, and, and where, like, that might not have been a desert, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, that, that we can't assume, when, you go, when you're going back that far in time, you have to, you have to cast, a, your imagination has to be very broad as to what the, okay. the land would even okay, look like. Okay, here's my idea then. It was, the five forts were built by the squishers who were lived underneath the water and it started at the underneath, it started underwater and underwater only castles. recently, like it used to only be like 500 feet above water and 500 <laughs> feet below water. Yeah, they I'm were, joking. there was a big moat. <laughs> I'm joking to be clear, but I, I, the idea of how ancient it is, it isn't necessarily built by humans. Right. So I, I don't, I'm not joking about that's that another element. one that might not be made by man. That's true. This is definitely built by some beings, but not necessarily humans. Yes, that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, and also could be built at least partly by magic. Humans yes, or against, giants yeah. using magic. You know? Or dragons or both. Yeah. And back to your point about number of people on the wall. I want to. I just thought of something. Sean, when Aegon's conquest began, there were 30,000 men in total, apparently, on the wall. All yeah. throughout the entire place. So still less than... The 50,000, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that also is just those buildings. It doesn't count anything surrounding those buildings. It might have been manned or housed people or whatever else, too. So right it's, on. It's 100 miles worth, so. All right, let's weigh in with our final guesses of what number eight and number nine are. Are you folks in the chat? Feel free to do the same. If you're listening after the fact, weigh in in the comments. The podcast episode should have a place to weigh in as well. We we often have a little spot for that. If you just uh, check the episode, you'll see. Uh, click on the episode in your podcast player. You can find a spot for that. Shay, is it too much or too late to do a poll? I don't know what the poll would be. Ah. I don't know which okay. of the options you think we should have in the poll. And people can only say one answer. So if, if, oh, if yeah. people have two, yeah, I, I would love difficult. to. But I think the logistics are a little awkward. We'll find some way to get a tally. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, we'll we'll be able to let people know basically what feedback we get when we do part two and or part three. We'll be able to keep you abreast of, of what the fandom says, what the what our listeners say. Part two, we're not going to start on the natural wonders now. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, why not? Let's dive right in. You know, it's we're only we're, we're not quite to the three hour mark yet. So, yeah, we got time. Yeah. No. Uh, OK, my guess is. I, I'll, yeah. Five forts in the high tower. Honorable mention to the mazes. I think the mazes are. Maybe number 10. I'll put them at number 10. I'll put the high tower at number nine. Five, four, six. They're not really in an order, though. So I'll say the mazes are my top pick that doesn't make it. Okay, so you say five forts and high tower. N- Nina also says five forts and high tower, but her honorable mention is the Eerie. So she's got a number, different number 10 than me. 
I'm saying the high tower and the Great Pyramid of Geese ruins. I'm saying he saw ruins and he still put it on the wonders. And also, honestly, a lot of people just assumed that it was one of the wonders when I looked up like documenting stuff. I looked at like Adam Whitehead's old post about it. Yeah. And he just had it as number eight. So I think a lot of people kind of just assumed that. I want it. To, I want my answer to be high tower and the five forts. I don't know that I think he saw the five forts. I want him to have seen the five forts because if he saw the five forts, he saw the Bleeding Sea, and the Bleeding Sea is one of my main guesses for the natural wonders. But I'm going to dig into that more in our part two where we we talk about that. But I really think the Bleeding Sea should be a natural wonder, but if he didn't see the five forts, he didn't see that. So I want to say both. I'm going to just choose to to say the Great Pyramid because I... I, I I I kind of just assumed it was for a lot of years too, so I I, I don't know. Okay, and Sean, I say the the pyramid of geese and the five forts. Those are my top two picks. Okay, uh, and you know of course they're dependent. They have asterisks, right? And my number three, I I'm hesitant to pick. I think it should be on some level the high tower, but my theory is it's not only because that's where he's from, but but I, that, I like that idea. I, you know, I guess if I do pick that one, that means he's not from there. You know. So. Yeah, I, I like that. That idea is represented. So three, three votes for the five forts out of the four of us. Three votes for the high tower. Two votes for the great pyramid. Uh, one vote for. No, that's it. Yeah, and then several on, different honorable mentions. We all we had some different honorable mentions there. Um. So Sean, why don't you get a cat while I read our outro? There you have it, folks. As a group, the the wonders mostly fall into a few basic categories. Like I said earlier, religion, defense, authority, and transportation. These things are often linked. Transportation of armies can create authority and or defense. Religion and authority are often very linked. They perform core societal functions in wondrous fashion, like the bells, things like that. Honestly, I want to give an honorable mention to Harrenhal. It's pretty amazing, but we're pretty sure as well. It was built after Lomas's time, right? It, it may have been close, though, because we're guessing Lomas was born and lived during the Century of Blood. Hall was finished basically at the end of that era. It's kind of like Aegon's Conquest marks the end of the Century of Blood. Well, the building of Hall coincides with the conquest of Harrenhal, or with the, the Aegon's Conquest. Regardless, it might be the most impressive place built in the world since Lomas's day, since he lived. Uh, Winterfell maybe deserves a mention as well because of the hot springs and the glass gardens. It's pretty ama- amazing. It's uh, it's less wondrous to us, perhaps, but it's pretty darn impressive in a low-tech world. All that growth and, and heat in a wintry place is... It might make the top 20. <laughs> Winterfell also serves, us, serves to remind us what a huge topic this is. And the wondrousness of Winterfell may increase as we go forward and see how it holds up in, you know, in the depths of winter. But also, this reminds us of why this is such a big topic and why we had to split it. Uh, Several comments from some uh, listeners here that we'll get through here. Good questions. Maxim Howard sends a super chat and says, why do you think Valyria was unable to find Bravos? They've got a 400-foot Titan for a front door, and Valyria was actively looking for them with dragons. Fog seems like a bad excuse. I'm thinking that the Titan was not built that in that era i think maybe they would have built maybe built it later uh, after the unmasking that's not clear though we don't know for sure about that and i don't know that they were looking that hard for bravos <laughs> that's but, what i think i think they weren't looking for them they weren't uh, they weren't a rebellious country that was trying to they weren't a revolutionary country they were just doing yeah. their own thing and uh, yeah i think they weren't weren't actually looking for them actively really it was a play it was a refuge for escaped slaves which they didn't like that but it there they had so many slaves like you see that when when bravos offered to pay for the ships that they stole when they absconded with them when they had their when they founded bravos they're like we're not paying for the slaves because we don't believe in slavery but we stole your ships we'll pay for that and valeria like they hardly cared (laughs) they're like yeah sure we don't care. That's fine. They're so rich. They just didn't care. I see where you're coming from, though. Like, it's maybe a little hard to explain how a city was concealed for so long. But there may have been some other things they did to keep themselves concealed that, that we're not aware of yet. Uh, Joe Magician says, and hey, Joe Magician, shout out Joe Magician. Check out Joe Magician's channel. Good friend of ours. 
He says, I think hemp hair is probably a reference to how a lot of ancient Greek and Roman statues used to have clothes put on them like mannequins to make them seem alive. Oh, yeah, good point, good point. That could be related to that, although green hair wouldn't make me think of real people in ancient in the ancient world. But hey, maybe it does there because you got you got green hair. They, they dye exactly. World. They dye their hair. Yeah, so you it got works in Bravo. Uh, Tyrashi and other places. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, okay, it works. Yeah. All right. Joe Magician says, wonder what the Summer Islanders do when they repeal a law. Do they, do they have to carve it off the tree or put like a, this is no longer in, in a, a functional law? <laughs> yeah, I guess. They just cut down a whole tree. They They're like, tree we're starting no. over. I don't know. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, probably not very many fires in the Summer Isles, I would imagine. One, yeah, they got to keep that under lockdown. They got they probably have some people whose job it is to make sure the tr- <laughs> trees don't. Work. I was going to say they probably have a dedicated force of firefighters and maybe uh, rules about having campfires around. No or, open flames. Yeah, yeah, same same rule, like similar to the laws you would have at any library, but much stricter. You know, like don't yeah, no open flames in the in the library <laughs> no. keep don't your bring, coffee away from the <laughs> the old books <laughs> don't bring anything that has bugs that'll eat trees you know like Good invasive point. species are a real no-no there Keep those moths away. Yeah, you're right. Keep the rats out. Yeah, good point. There's a lot of those things that we I think don't be like worry about as much. Termites or whatever, and, right? Like yeah, mites. Keep I don't the know. yeah termites. That's a good point. Uh, you definitely want you cats know, around your around your books because they'll eat those rats. <laughs> I'll even tell you that it's a little, there's a little bit more of awareness or concern of like fires, wildfires and stuff here in Colorado than in Georgia. There's more signs and rules. Oh, yeah. Weather (laughs) alerts and stuff like that. Jet is in a room knocking things down now. (laughs) (laughs) We, yeah, we don't, you're right. Like we're not worried about wildfires in Georgia here. It's just too humid. We're like, how could that even yeah right it's just not gonna happen like it wouldn't it couldn't burn like it would just get and snuffed out get by the humidity strong either that's yeah that's the true it's out here you get wind builds more momentum and goes farther distances our trivia answer the question was which of the known seven wonders has been destroyed in palace of a thousand rooms there you go discord user minotaur pointed out that vase dothrak might have some minor wonders probably nothing that's in the top nine or maybe even the top 20, but they've stolen so many statues from places they've destroyed and hauled back so many things like that. There might be some pretty cool things there. You know, Vase Dothrak by itself probably doesn't qualify, but it might because it has so many gods and goddesses in statue form that have been hauled there. Danny is awestruck by having them all in one place. And Lomas probably didn't see this because this is something that came along after the unleashing of the Dothraki. He would not have seen this. You know what this makes me think of? I thought of that when we first started getting this topic that that might be one, but then realized, no, I don't think the timing adds up. So Can I give you what this makes me think of? The Dothraki taking wonders of the world. There's a good Futurama bit where they go like to the beach and they all of like the world wonders or like all these monuments are all at one beach and they're like yeah new new york city had had a had a super villain mayor for a while and he stole all of the monuments and then there's like great guy great guy <laughs> great guy but yeah, like, guy, he also yeah. he put himself on mount rushmore <laughs> like anyways that's those are death rocky vibes right there for sure yeah this is, they don't have the technology the same way but they like screw it we'll haul that thing all the way there well rather our slaves will haul that thing all the way there so now Lincoln, that's Washington, Drogo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So that the the mother of mountains, though, might be a candidate for a natural wonder, however, which maybe he did go there before that. That might have been a known thing before the Dothraki emerged as these great conquerors and destroyers. They they certainly existed before that. They just See, were kind I, of contained by the Valyrians and, and, and et cetera. Yeah, I think the Dothraki lands and, and and province would have been one of the more difficult places for him to travel. Yeah, it's it's easier to go there now, now ironically, but he's not around now. And yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I think you would have been... Lomas Longstrider would not have have been striding so long, I think. Yeah, I there. don't think they would have drawn his interest in that era because they're like... He might have been curious, but they don't sound like the kind of people that would have wonders, you know, because they're they're horse lord people. They just they don't like planting farm like they think planting crops is 
is against their religion. So yeah, they're not likely <laughs> build large edifices if that's their that's their the attitude. Nomadic cultures don't yeah don't usually yeah. build large structures. Yeah, exactly. So he they they might be and, and especially because he, he might not have, he might have barely heard of them. They would have been a, a, a not well known culture in his time. Um, so yeah, he might have kind of passed them over, but maybe not. Maybe not. We will certainly discuss the possibility. The possibility of the Mother of Mountains as a candidate, along with all the other ones, when we discuss Loma's Longstrider and the wonders made by gods. And, as I said, we'll be exploring and developing a third episode, which will not have much to do with Lomas, though he'll surely get mentioned, where we talk about the unnatural wonders of the world. Because going through this process has drawn up a lot of examples that fit that. And we're going to want to compile that and put it in episode form for you all to enjoy. Should be good times. Can I say, can you believe we're at about, we're at almost two hours and 50 minutes. Yeah. And we thought we would do the wonders made by man and the natural wonders in one episode at one How point silly in of time. Me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so silly. So silly. What was I thinking? So here we go with some episodes that relate to the topics we talked about today. There's quite a few. The Doom, of course. The Freehold of Valyria. The Wars of Valyria. Those are all relevant to the destruction of the Slaver's Bay, to the, the wonders that may have been present in Valyria itself. Nymeria, Mother Roin, also related to Valyria since they destroyed that. Uh, the Century of Blood. The fall of Valyria kicked off the Century of Blood, and we think that's when Lomas may have lived. That's our best guess, anyway. The Kingdom of Sarnor. We did a whole episode on them. That's where the Palace of a Thousand Rooms was. We talked about the Roman roads, which compares to the Valyrian roads, as well as the wall in the A Song of Ice and Fire in Rome episode. We talked about giants and building things, giants being used for that, and the bones in the caves of places like Norvos, which will come up when we discuss the caves of Norvos. So When Giants Roamed is our first episode in that series, but also Brandon the Builder and Patreon episode The Buildings of Brandon. We have an episode on Yee-T, like I said. We have an episode on the Great Empire of the Dawn, which is about the same length as this one. And it talks about a little bit more about the five forts and Ashai and the fused stone and several related things. We have an episode on Castle Rock. We have an episode on the many-faced Azor Ahai, where we talk about the various myth cycles related to saving the world that have a lot in common. And the possibility that Azor Ahai is multiple figures. And talk about the five forts. Yes, five forts comes up in that one as well. So yeah, we've had plenty of time, plenty of occasions to discuss the five forts. None terribly recently. But I think there. that was one of the most exciting things to me in like my history of be of, of a song of ice and fire was when the world of ice and fire, not the world of ice and fire, came out when the maps of ice, the lands of ice and fire came that out. That was cool. And we saw the five forts on there and some of these other stuff, and we dug in, and then like we only got more more fuel for those theories as as the world of ice and fire came out and so on, and it still transfixes me. I always say I'm not much of a theorist uh, it's not really my passion when it comes to loving this world but i love the world building theories i love that type of theory world building theories are fun and that's yeah it is some of our bread and butter we love that and you we love hearing from you on that as well if you have theories about any of these places or want us to cover them in in more depth let us know one or both or anything else you want to let us know or comment on feel free do that in the comment section of either the video or the podcast episode or send us an email or join our discord or our facebook group and start a discussion that involves a lot of your fellow westorians and not just uh those of us speaking into the microphones thanks for coming everybody we certainly do appreciate your presence your listening your support and we, yeah we wouldn't be here without you Thanks to Nina, whose notes were super invaluable as always. Definitely check out goodqueenalley.tumblr.com for more takes related and otherwise. Thanks to Joey, Jesse, Bran, and Michael Klarfeld for work on our theme songs and our video intro and our maps. Those things all make our show look and sound so nice. So nice. Uh, Extra yes. thanks to Michael Klarfeld for his maps today because we used them a lot. Sure did. And mm. we used his art of Casterly Rock. And mm. extra thanks to Christina Kay, who did the Long Bridge 
art for us a long time ago and we finally got to debut it and thanks to all the other artists and a special shout out to the unseen westeros yeah. project which is where i got some of the artwork i used from which was if you look up unseen westeros you will see um all of the art from it but it was just like kind of a, a fan made uh project that was approved by george but isn't is non-canonical but is really uh, a great look at some of these far-flung locations i have quite a few i have a rotating desk i have rotating desktop art and a lot of them are from unseen westeros yeah yeah me too <laughs> I, I make our wallpaper yeah, you did you put them on I my computer that, yeah. <laughs> you did that for me yes <laughs> and i thank you for it because my computer my background is awesome and it, it actually occasionally inspires me when i'm writing I'm like oh yeah there it is there's one of those things i'm writing about right now like the maze maker image came up like this morning when i was putting the finishing touches on i had a couple last ideas i wanted to throw into this document and i was like oh yeah look at that maze maker stuff yeah keeps me in the world the, those visuals really help keep you immersed it's mostly about the thoughts the imagination, but those visuals really help fire that and, and give it some more dimension. So yeah, we'll have a lot to talk about with the natural wonders and the unnatural wonders and all the other topics that are yet to come on History of Westeros podcast in the future, of which we consider that to be an endless amount. Until next time, you know what to do. Valar, reread us.